Good morning and welcome. I'm Jonathan Holloway, president of Rutgers, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this symposium marking 10 years since the tragic death of Tyler Clementi. It was a decade ago that this extraordinarily gifted musician and Rutgers freshman with so much to look forward to took his life following despicable acts of cyberbullying by his roommate and a shocking complicity by other students who could have stood up for him. This is a devastating story that reverberated across the country and around the world. It remains so today. Somehow Tyler's family found the strength to carry on and more than that, to lead the way. They formed a foundation dedicated to saving lives by working tirelessly to change laws and change hearts to stop harassment, intimidation, and bullying. So much has changed for the better in the past decade. Marriage equality, laws and policies against bullying, cultural pushback against stereotyping, a dramatic shift in public opinion in favor of gay rights, and a growing list of exemplary role models in public life. Organizations like the Tyler Clementi Foundation have provided invaluable resources to empower young people to express themselves and calling upon all of us to be upstanders, which can make all the difference. But there's so much more work yet to be done. The suicide of Channing Smith in Tennessee last year, a target of cyberbullying himself, makes that point painfully clear. And as a 2018 white paper by the Tyler Clementi Center at Rutgers suggests, our college campuses must do more to be welcoming places for all students. That report cited a survey of college students which showed that while 85% of heterosexual students felt their sexual orientation was valued on their campus, that was true for fewer than half of queer spectrum students who also felt less safe and less welcome. In another survey, nearly one quarter of queer spectrum students had seriously considered suicide in the previous 12 months and an even higher percentage of trans students considered the same. These numbers have to change. Our society has to keep moving forward. The topic of today's symposium, Life After the Closet, speaks to the difficult choice that confronts so many people in the LGBTQ community, especially gay men like Tyler. It's so critically important to talk about these issues because they really can be life and death. I want to thank all of today's speakers, most especially Jane Clementi, for holding this conversation. As a newcomer to Rutgers, I'm proud of our university's commitment and I'm proud to affirm both in word and deed, the dignity and value and humanity of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and questioning young people. Let us honor Tyler's life and passion and excellence in making our university and our society truly inclusive, welcoming and life affirming. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jane Clementi. Jane Clementi co-founded the Tyler Clementi Foundation alongside husband Joe because she wanted to make sure that our society learned the consequences of discrimination and bullying as she learned all too personally through the loss of her son Tyler. A native of New Jersey and devoted mother of three sons, Jane speaks passionately to parents and community leaders about the need to not merely accept or tolerate children who come out as LGBT but to embrace them as wondrous creations of God. Jane, a registered nurse, speaks on the need for parents of LGBT children to come out and speak openly of the love they have for their children. And in doing so, each one of us can impact the world around us and create accepting environments. Jane has spoken before the U.S. Congressional Help Committee, the National Cathedral, and numerous other faith communities, colleges, universities, high schools, and workplaces. Good morning. I'm so glad I'm able to be here with everyone at today's conference as we hear from the experts and continue some difficult but much needed conversations around privacy and intruding into or invading the private physical and or emotional spaces of others, as well as the humiliation and pain and shame that can result. These conversations are very personal for me because you see, it was my son, Tyler Clementi, who started many of these conversations 10 years ago, when Tyler made national headlines as the target of a cyberbullying situation. In the fall of 2010, when Tyler started his freshman year at Rutgers, with much enthusiasm and excitement for a promising future in a place where I believe he thought he could be himself. But unfortunately, Tyler did not find that to be the case. 
because within a few short weeks, Tyler's roommate live streamed Tyler in a sexual encounter with another man. His roommate then tweeted about the event and invited many others to join in and watch, announcing to the entire world a personal moment that should have remained just that private encounter. I can only imagine how humiliated Tyler must have felt in front of his new doormates. He may have even thought that his sexual orientation was something to be ashamed of as he continued to read the jokes and comments on social media. It was at this point that Tyler's reality became very twisted and distorted as he became totally consumed with and concerned only about the words of people who were only interested in humiliating him. He could no longer see how special and precious he was, nor could he find the resources and support that were available to him, both at Rutgers University as well as at home. Because it was at this point that Tyler made a permanent decision to a temporary situation, a decision that we can never go back and change. On September 22nd, 2010, Tyler died by suicide. He was only 18 years old. And as much as we wanted to go back and change Tyler's actions, the reality was we could not. But we could move forward and put our energy and efforts into making sure no other student or young person ever feels the pain, shame, and humiliation that Tyler experienced. That's why we created the Tyler Clemente Foundation, which is working to end all online and offline bullying, experienced by both youth and adults alike whether at school or because of legislative inequality or because of religious dogma caused by teachings and traditions that devalue the human spirit and cause so much pain and despair. The Tyler Clemente Foundation started out simple. Our goal was to see change and we wanted to see people being kind, respectful and civil to each other. We started the Tyler Clemente Foundation, not just to raise awareness around the issues that impacted Tyler, but to create actions and solutions to those issues based on research. And what better place than Rutgers for that to occur? An institution that is known for its academic excellence and research initiatives. We were very pleased when Rutgers University wanted to partner with us, the foundation and family, to develop the Tyler Clemente Center at Rutgers. I believed it was the perfect fit. And I am still very optimistic that the Tyler Clemente Center for Diversity Education and Bias Prevention will become a leader in developing strategies, resources, and programs based on research. Programs that will promote safe college campuses for all vulnerable groups so that all students will be able to focus on learning without any distractions because of fear for who they are, who they love, or anything else that makes them different. Resources that will not only benefit Rutgers students, but can be implemented in colleges and universities all across the country. Because no matter what makes someone different or vulnerable, every student deserves the chance to succeed and thrive. I am very excited to hear from the presenters today on the very important topics of life after the closet, examining both the harmful and yet sometimes protective elements of the closet because they do both coexist. And sadly, now I know that Tyler experienced both aspects. Of course, what breaks my heart is learning and reading recently about the harmful, painful side of the closet that Tyler experienced. Learning that the Tyler I knew, the enthusiastic, articulate, thoughtful, and determined Tyler, was sadly, at times, not the way he saw himself. I saw a creative, inquisitive, adventurous young man with a passion for music who was truly a gifted violinist. But that was not the Tyler who documented his pain and sadness, his anger and loneliness on the pages I recently found during my move. But that Tyler was so very different from who I knew. I hardly recognized this side of Tyler as he never exposed his innermost thoughts and sorrows to anyone. And that's why we need these conversations today. And that is why I'm especially enthused about the proposed solutions coming out of these conversations. These ideas that can be put into actions, which 
will be implemented into programs and policies to keep our LGBTQ students safe and supported. I do want to encourage everyone to go to the Tyler Clemente Foundation's website, tylerclemente.org, to find out more about Tyler's Foundation and more specifically how you can become an upstander, a person who does not remain a passive bystander, but rather someone who stands up and speaks out in a bullying situation. And finally, I want to share my gratitude with everyone who helped to create a new legacy of hope around Tyler's name. Creating a center that will have longevity and a future that will hopefully help many students. Thank you to all the many people who have supported the Tyler Clemente Center over the past decade. And I'm extremely grateful to have the support and oversight of Dr. Anna Branch and Dr. Joan Collier moving the Tyler Clemente Center for Diversity, Education, and Bias Prevention forward into the new decade. Thank you all for coming. Our next speaker is Dr. Perry Helkitis. Dr. Helkitis is a public health psychologist, researcher, educator, and advocate who is Dean and Professor of Biostatistics and Urban Global Public Health at the Rucker School of Public Health. Dr. Helkitis is the founder and director of the Center for Health, Identity, Behavior, and Prevention Studies. For three decades, Dr. Helkitis's program of research has examined the intersection between HIV, HPV, and other STIs, drug abuse, and mental health burden with regard to the biological, behavioral, psychosocial, and structural factors that predispose these and other health disparities in the LGBTQ plus population. His work focuses on the translation of this knowledge through implementation science research that examines the effectiveness of tailored and adaptive interventions in order to prevent and eliminate these disparities. His research program has been awarded over 30 million in grant funding. Most recently, he has been involved with New Jersey contact tracing efforts, helping to develop the curriculum and launch the New Jersey Community Contact Tracing Corps. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Perry Halkidis. I'm Dean, Professor, and Director for the Center for Health, Identity, Behavior, and Prevention Studies at the Rutgers School of Public Health at Rutgers University. I'm very honored to be here with you this morning to talk somewhat about the role of the closet in the lives of LGBTQ people, specifically reflections on shame and the closet in the lives of gay men across time and space. This presentation and today's symposium is in honor of Tyler Clemente. It is now 10 years since we lost Tyler from our lives. Like many young LGBTQ people, he was taken from us way too early. Today, we continue to see high rates of suicide in the LGBTQ population, as well as increased rates of homicide towards LGBTQ people especially black trans women. The lives of LGBTQ people continue to be completely put upon by the realities of our society. So as we think about the lives of gay men across the generations, it's important to note that the closet, coming out of the closet, has multiple meanings. The closet provides protection, but it also enables shame. It is a tool. It is a, not a possibility for all other marginalized people to live in the closet. But for LGBTQ people, the closet provides a way to protect their lives, to protect their emotions from those who might victimize them. The decision to step outside the closet is up to the person coming out and no one else. And thus, no one should be forced out. And importantly, to our conversation today, there is no lockstep pattern for how and when someone may come out. I explored these ideas in my last book, Out in Time, The Public Lives of Gay Men from Stonewall to the Queer Generation. In this work, I try to understand what the challenges were for gay men coming out. And this idea of convergence 
is one that emerged very fully for me. The idea being that the identity of queer people, of the queer individual, is analogous to this painting, Convergence, one of Jackson Pollock's most famous works. The landscape is comprised of three primary colors that appear to be bound to black and white contours. Conversely, the lines and shapes seem to be moving swiftly across space and time while gently intersecting. Within each juncture, different ways of coming out are engendered awaiting to converge with looming intersectionalities so as to actualize a myriad of multidimensional identities. Therefore, an identity comes with a responsibility, the lack of which creates fear and uncertainty. In the book, I documented the coming out stories, the gay identity development across three generations that I defined as the Stonewall generation, the AIDS generation, and the queer generation. I wanted to interpret the changes and the constants during the coming out experience. And I wanted to understand coming out as a lifelong process influenced by psychological realities. And importantly, to determine how gay identity development and disclosure impact the health of the individual as well as the health of the population. And to do so, I used a life stories approach to develop a better understanding of coming out and the significance of what it is to be a gay man in each generation. Personal narratives provide an understanding of the social and emotional paths throughout the generations. It allows me to situate the coming out experience during the period of adolescence to young adulthood, uh, young adulthood and help to assure that the interaction with sociopolitical context was similar across the men in each generation. So the life stories approach provides a lens into the mind and the heart of the individual and how that particular person has made sense of their gay identity. I come back to the generations that I spoke of earlier, the first being the Stonewall generation. For this particular group, I interviewed five men, ranging in age from 62 to 78 years, um, and whose lives were defined by this extremely important moment in history, 1969, the Stonewall riots in New York City, which is marked by many as the beginning of the LGBTQ rights movement. Jaundice policies fueled denial and the suppression of sexual identity, forcing many gay men of the Stonewall generation to never publicly disclose their sexual identity. The Stonewall riots contributed to the de development of the Gay Liberation Front, as well as other gay, lesbian, and bisexual civil rights organizations. In the picture, you see two of the pioneers of the LGBTQ rights movement, Sylvia Rivera and Marcia Johnson. And Tom, one of the men who I interviewed for the book, talked about being a member of this generation as follows. He said, look, we grew up in an age where who we are and how we express ourselves as sexual beings was abhorrent, you know? And for a long time, it was, you know, we were breaking the law. The next generation is the generation with which I identify known as the AIDS generation. This generation also consisted of five men who I've interviewed who were between the ages of 42 and 51 at the time of the interview. And the defining moment for these particular men was the AIDS crisis. The HIV AIDS epidemic shaped the lives of many gay men from this generation. And epidemiological data shows that men, gay men born between 1960 and 1964 were the ones who are, are most and were most impacted by HIV. Gay men of this generation lived in anticipation of existing in fear or shame in connection with distorted beliefs concerning the HIV epidemic from both the gay community and the heterosexual community. The last group with whom I spoke, I defined as the queer generation, the youngest of the three generations, again, a total of five men from this generation, ranging in age from 19 to 20, 29, these five men were the most racially and ethnically diverse of all of those who I interviewed. The young men in this particular generation were empowered by the age of the internet and social media. 
And the queer generation is vastly diversified and educated in HIV AIDS, gay identity, race, and cultural differences. Many gay men from this era are not in the court accordance with the hegemonic white masculine conception that typically defines the gay population. So to understand the generations, it is very important to understand the crisis that defined each generation. The Stonewall generation, the AIDS generation, and the queer generation, while experiencing some similarities, all had a very unique crisis that defined their age group. So the generational crisis was a phenomenon that was forged by the interplay of social, cultural, political, legal, medical, and economic factors that birthed each period. I wanna say up front that while I identify each generation with a crisis, when I come to the queer generation, I may reiterate this, but I wanna say it up front right now, that the crisis of the queer generation also includes the crisis of the age generation and the crisis of the Stonewall generation. So for the Stonewall generation, the main crisis was the crisis of identity. The men of the Stonewall generation experienced an identity induced by an ex existential fear of forging an identity influenced and framed by the social circumstances that denounced being gay as both pathological and criminal, compelled these men from this generation to compartmentalize their personalities, creating multiple personas in order to survive their, their lack of authenticity or their lack of ability to be authentic with themselves created a psychological disconnect that hindered the integration of their multiple identities. Systematic oppression and social stigmatization forced many gay men into isolation or refrain from acting on their sexual desires. Why is this so? Because in many countries, including ours, there were laws that made homosexuality illegal. In fact, in the Great Britain, the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1885 was used as a means to punish World War II hero Alan Turing, who was chemically castrated because of his homosexuality. Alan Turing, as we know, is the father of the modern computer and a great mathematician. With regard to this crisis and the regard to the realities of this particular generation, one of the men with whom I spoke said this, I felt afraid. I was fearful because I saw what had happened historically to gay people. But then I saw what was happening with the gay revolution. So, you know, there was fear over here. There was hope over here. And, you know, the arrow of time goes only in one direction. I thought, well, you know, eventually, but how quickly? Back then, we didn't know. My friend Felix, who's 87, I guess, 87 years old, he was a dancer. He danced with Judy Garland's boys. And yeah, I think he was arrested along with one of his friends. In fact, in 1967, a very significant documentary was produced by CBS called The Homosexuals with Mike Wallace as its host. And the message was this, the average homosexual if there be such, is promiscuous. He is not interested in nor capable of a lasting relationship like a heterosexual marriage. That was 1967, only 53 years ago when those words were uttered. The crisis of AIDS defined the generation that if I, which is my generation, uh, men born in the United States um, during the 1960s, particularly between 1960 and 1964, were most impacted by this disease. Not that men from the Stonewall generation or the queer generation are not, they were also. But it was primarily rooted in men in this age group. The HIV epidemic instilled in everyone a fear of the unknown, a precarious future or none at all. AIDS began to define coming out. Coming out is not only then tied to a sexual orientation, but to HIV status. And for many gay men who became HIV positive, disclosure of their sexual identity often accompanied disclosure of the HIV status. And so in that regard, one of the men with whom I spoke said, 
I recall seeing this film. It was a film on made on TV about Ryan White, and it stirred up feelings of sadness. It was hard to hear about the story of this child with HIV. At that time, he was considered an innocent victim. When I heard this terminology, it made me feel shame. Back then, I felt like I was guilty, a guilty victim since I contracted the virus. This was a 53-year-old man who I named Emilio, who was talking about the Ryan White story, which appeared in 1989. Headlines like this appeared in the New York Times, and statements like this were made by Senator Jesse Helms, who said, we have to call a spade a spade and perverted human being a perverted human being, referring to gay men and the onslaught that AIDS created in the lives of gay people. Finally, the youngest generation that I've defined as the, the queer generation is defined in my mind primarily by a crisis known as the crisis of failure. The financial crisis has left an indelible, indelible mark on the lives of members of the queer generation. According to the US Bureau of Labor during 2017 to 2018, unemployment rates were particularly high for young people. For men between ages 20 and 24, it hovered around seven and 8%. For 25 to 34 year old men, the rate was around 4%. These numbers are certainly worse now post COVID. And the economic crisis of the era was affected by the major political upheaval, identity politics, politics, financial and economic instability, and the chaotic nature of a post 9-11 reality, one that we face very much to this day. The economic meltdown of 2018 specifically created subpar and unfavorable life conditions, especially for gay men of color. How easy is it to come out depends like on your economic status, one of these men said. Like, can you financially support yourself if worse comes to worse? Like if you were kicked out of your home, could you support yourself? Or do you have a network of people that can help you? And location as well. If I were to come out in like Charlotte, where this person was born, or like a smaller town versus New York, there would have been difference. There are more services here. And if I were kicked out and be homeless, there are more services in New York than in a smaller town. But coming to now, there are more services in general. But is it easier than other generations for us to come out? Hmm, I'm not exactly sure. And Joel Stein wrote about this phenomenon of the financial crisis, the post 9-11 world for this generation, for the millennials who define most of the queer generation as follows. Their development is stunted. More people ages to 18 to 29 live with their parents than with a spouse. In 1992, the nonprofit Families and Work Institute reported that 80% of people under 23 wanted to one day have a job with greater responsibility. 10 years later, only 60% did. Very easy in this article to point the finger at the younger generation. I, on the other hand, have a different approach. Some members of the previous generation demean the experience of younger people. But I think that the, the, the crises of the younger generation, of the queer generation, are no better or no worse than the ones from before. They're just different. And young gay men coming of age now certainly have to deal with the financial realities of our time, have to deal with COVID, have to deal with an uncertain future, also have to deal with AIDS because AIDS has not gone away, and also have to deal with reconciling their gay identity. And so it is a cumulative effect that young people continue to face. And while certainly social and political conditions have in some ways become better, and media representations have put LGBTQ people in the forefront, it is still a difficult psychological process for people to come out to their families, to their friends, in their work, and in their lives. And that's what I wanna to attend to right now, coming out and developing a gay identity. So much of the difficulty of coming out is rooted in this concept of otherness. The challenges of being gay commences at a very young age and persists throughout the course of our lives. At the center of all of these challenges is an embedded feeling of otherness. Gay men seek to become self-actualized by integrating their gay identity with other aspects of who, who they are as people as a whole. The processes are complicated by ongoing societal conditions 
but also exacerbated by the gay community itself, where conceptions of maleness and normalcy, issues of racism, and other such conditions facilitate and fuel drug use and sexual risk. Otherness is a sense of living on the outside of a heteronormative society and culture, and is often how gay men understand themselves. If unchecked, it can serve as a source of loneliness and social isolation, contributing to other psychological burdens that give rise to numerous health disparities, including but not limited to HIV. Gay men's relationships and to the microsystem of families and the macro system of society serve as the source and weight of the otherness that we must endure. Coming out to our parents serves as an initial step for many as a means to make sense and integrate this otherness, diminishing the negative impact that feelings of other difference may have in our lives. However, this feeling of otherness just does not just fall from the sky. Gay men's feelings of otherness, feeling that something is different about them, begins at a very young age. The understanding is that otherness is an indicator of one's sexual identity. It is reinforced by social settings and groups such as families, neighborhoods, schools, communities, religious congregations, and workplaces, and within local, so state, and federal governments. Loneliness is one outcome of otherness. Loneliness is a palpable reality for gay men, which drives risk and diminishes overall physical and mental health. In 2016, in an article, journalist Michael Hobbs articulated the impact of loneliness in the lives of gay men, connecting this burden to feelings of otherness and the masking of sexual identity, the masking or the closet in which many of us live for a very long time. Loneliness doesn't truly ever go away and continues to permeate our existences, even we are, when we are physically, romantically, and emotionally not alone. A snowball effect in which the feeling of different or other or less than or knowing but hiding leads to ongoing attempts to try to fit in and suffer the silence. So even when we're out of the closet, we are still trying to fit in because we have spent a lifetime trying to fit in. One of the men with whom I spoke says it as follows. I was kind of fooling around with a friend of mine who was on the crew team, but la la like again, was mostly like mutual masturbation and stuff. And he had a girlfriend. And then it was just, it got weirder and weirder the longer I was there because I realized that if I, that I were to come out, it was like, I look like a weirdo if I come out there. And so I got really depressed at one point about that because I feel like by the time of my sophomore year, I was like, now I just come out if I'm going to just be like the weirdo because there's no reason for me not to come out before in this place. Does that make sense? In other words, this young man was negotiating his sexual behavior with his sexual identity, but couldn't reconcile the two and didn't know if it was safe for him to come out. In fact, Many individuals fear coming out. The notion of other causes many gay men to be in a state of uncertainty about coming out. Self-development, however, will be stunted if gay men are unable to embrace this otherness and integrate it with the rest of their lives. But that does not mean that one should be forced out of a closet. One should be enabled in their own time and in their own space to come out. Feelings of otherness are exacerbated and in many ways heightened by parents who portray their children's sexuality as abnormal, bizarre, and morally wrong. And as a result, many make a decision to stay in the closet until it is safe to do so. I myself, in 1981, came out as a gay man, but only after I left my home and went to school at Columbia. Here's what another man said who I interviewed. My best friend at the time, I kind of had dissociated myself with him because he came out. I mean, he was all about Madonna. His entire locker was nothing but Madonna, Madonna, Madonna. My locker was right next to him and I was all Janet Jackson. It was all rhythm nation, control. 
you know, and so we have like dueling battles of the divas, but yet like I didn't even admit to being gay and he was really brave. He said, fuck it, I'm going to come out. And he did. And he was bullied awfully, awfully. The member of the, of the age generation who shared that story, who chose to stay in the closet because he saw what happened to his friend who came out. And so the decision about what to come out, as I stated earlier, has to be in control of the person who is living the life. And when that person feels safe and when that person feels right. So in 2010, the Guardian reported the findings of a poll conducted by Stonewall, which is a community based organization in the UK. 1500 openly gay, uh, openly LGBTQ actually people were asked about the age in which they had come out. Among older adults age 60 and above, the average age when they came out was 37 years of age. For individuals in their 30s, the average age was 21 years of age. Among people between the ages of 18 to 24, it was 17 years of age. With each generation, gay men have started to come out a younger age. Living in a more enlightened era has contributed to lowering the coming out age as generations continue to evolve. However, the LGBTQ population continues to confront the perpetual need to explain and clarify who they are since coming out is an ongoing process that lasts a lifetime. We just don't come out once. We come out our whole lives. And I challenge every heterosexual person who's listening to this or watching this to imagine a life where they had to come out as straight every time they met someone. It's sort of like you're taking hold of your identity and that tattoo. I'm owning this identity. I'm gay. I'm a man. I've got a pink triangle on me. I'm gay. It means I can't take it off. That's what Juan, who's 19 years old at the time of the interview, said about coming to, into his own being as a gay man. Gay men must go through stages of development from childhood to adulthood in order to reconcile their identity. They must interpret to learn who they are aside from what is directly surrounding them. For many of us, especially older gay men, there were not these media representations in front of our eyes. Then we need to internalize, to incorporate perceived knowledge into ourselves and understand that we are separate from our social and physical environments. And finally, reconciling our identities, integrating into our overall well-being, while we'll evaluate self, self, social norms, and while we seek to achieve and maintain our gay identity. Some men are able to transition from one stage to the next swiftly. However, sociopolitical conditions, cultural circumstances could delay such a process. For example, this was the case for then former governor Jim McGreevy, who kindly was able to come out in 2007 and said, I am not apologizing for being a gay man, but rather for having a personal feelings impact my decisions making and for not having had the courage to be open about who I was. Again, the challenge of living in a heterosexual, heteronormative world and wanting to aspire to a higher office such as government was not in the governor's understanding of how society worked. And so he chose to live a closeted life until he could not live a closeted life. Becoming a gay man is a unique journey that we each embark upon in our search for identity. And it's a road we take down, we take in our lives. From birth, human beings are blank canvases that come up, that come to life with each intersecting brushstroke that delineates the sexual identity of gay men. I'm proud, I'm out, and there's no hidden parts of me. It has to do with maybe my way of looking at relationships. But what it is like to be a gay man doesn't resonate all that much for me. I've been out for a very long time and sort of part of my fiber. And that was told to me by a young man named Yasser who was able to fully integrate his identity into his being after several years of negotiating what it meant to be a gay man. Coming out for children um, is often predicated 
on coming out to their parents. There are no lockstep, certainly easy ways to tell your parents that you're gay. This is particularly challenging for young men, young women, young trans folks who, are, who come from cultures that have very rigid conceptions of masculinity and femininity. Irrespective of generations, telling your parents about the most intimate part of yourself never gets easier. To be clear, while parents are often tolerant, they're not always accepting. And tolerance and acceptance are not synonymous and should not be conflated. In fact, a Pew Research Institute report published in 2015 found the following. Um, that 57% of parents would not be upset if they learned their child was gay. 39% noted they would be upset in some way, and 17% reported they would be very upset. So more than half of those who were interviewed in 2015 indicated an upset. So then how safe is it for the young person to come out who probably has a very clear awareness of the feeling of the parents before even beginning the process of preparing to come out? And here's the quote from one of the men with whom I spoke, Jeremy, 26 years old at the time of the interview, who said the following. Once I did that, came out, and everybody was more accepting, it was like I said, my dad's just changed for the better. It was weird. And just being able to be myself around my family, because that's kind of where I used to be. You know, I was, I was always myself around my family. But then when I decided to accept to be me, that I was gay, I wanted to be, I wanted them to know too. And I wanted to be okay with coming out and them knowing that. Then me bringing, you know, friends over that are gay or to have a boyfriend. And while Jeremy tells a very nice, a very accepting, a very loving story of his family, and which is also the case for me, that is not necessarily the norm. And for many, the result is rejection from the family. And we know very clearly from the research that familial rejection is, is a, often a source of suicidal ideation for young LGBTQ people. Telling our parents is not prescribed. We are not taught the tools on how to come out. Every gay man finds a methodology in disclosing to their parents, relying on social emotional tools that create a psychological space for their identity. Most of the men who, whom I spoke utilize some form of written or multimodal communication, such as letters or electronic mail or text, to disclose their parents. No matter the generation, disclosing your sexual identity to our parents never gets easier, as I said earlier. And this letter is very, very telling and very illustrative um, of what, um, what many gay men go through. And this was written by Emilio. 53 years old, who wrote to his parents this letter before he went and visited them in upstate New York. He said, dear mom and dad, boy, I don't even know where to begin with this letter. It probably is the hardest thing that I will ever have to write. And I hope that someday you will understand why I'm doing this, because this is so important to me. I've decided to type it rather than write it. First of all, I wanted to thank you so much for being wonderful parents. Not only have you both come from different countries and learned to speak English, the English language, but you have also done so much more. You have raised six bright and loving children. You have also ensured our success by teaching us, all of us, to be proud, independent, and to have love for each other no matter what. The strength of love is the reason I can no longer deny this truth. I want you to know and love me for who I really am. Secondly, I want you to know at this point in my life, I have never been happier or healthier. This is the first time in my life that I can actually love myself. What I am trying to tell you is that I am gay. You have also said that you will love your children no matter what. And I hope that you would love me even though I'm also HIV positive. This means that I have been exposed to the AIDS virus. There's a chance that I might progress to AIDS and there's also a chance that I may not. And he continues to tell his parents the rest of the story is, is, uh, of his life in his letter. And it concludes it with love and support all is a possibility. 
Many gay men, however, do not tell come out to their parents. This was the case of my husband. Some gay men never usually use, utter the words, I'm gay, to their parents. And there's an unspoken understanding that develops over time. Very common for older men, for men of the age generation and Stonewall generation who use nonverbal disclosure. Um, but it, this is, seems to have fallen out of favor for younger gay men. But even with this nonverbal recognition, Pam, Pam, Pam was and parents have to realign their relationship with their child and the process learned to emerge as parents of a gay child. When faced with challenging situations, emotions, some men take a more compartmentalized approach such as this, as keep so, in, so keeping their sexual identity separate from other aspects of their life, especially when it comes to their family. And then there are those situations when we are forced out. Now and then, the opportunity to disclose to our parents is precipitated neither by choice nor by the result of a crisis, but by the result of a crisis before we can uncover the truth. One narrative that I uh, heard happened to a 21-year-old. The parents needed to repair their son by sending him to a therapist when they found out by another family member that he was gay. Well, when I was 21, he decided he was going to send me to a psychiatrist to get fixed. Yep, I'm going to get fixed by Dr. M. I went to him twice in which he ultimately apparently decided to tell everything to my father that I said in sessions, which is a huge breach of ethics, as you know. The coming out experiences in relation to our families and our parents shadow so much of our lives are rooted in our feeling of difference that precedes our abilities to understand our sexuality. The fact is that for all of us, there's an ongoing challenge to negotiate our sexual identity throughout our lives. Even after our families know who we are, we continue to seek our integration of our sexual identity with all other aspects of our being and enduring an effort shaped by feelings of otherness deeply embedded in our emotional lives. I'd like to sort of take this in a different direction right now and talk about the issues of intersectionality, racism, and a closet. And let me start with a story. Imagine there is a race about to take place with five participants with the overall goal to make it first to the top of a steep hill. Each runner is given a vest as so to identify the individual throughout the race. The first participant is a white middle-class heterosexual man. The second runner is an African-American middle-class heterosexual man. The third is an African-American lower-class, lower SES heterosexual man. The fourth is an African-American man of lower SES who's also a gay man. The fifth is an African-American man of lower SES class who, excuse me, a lower, gay, lower SES with a gay woman. Unbeknownst to the participants, their vest will be secretly contain extra weight, 20 pounds for every ism in each, that each participant possesses. The concept of carrying extra weight for every negatively perceived ism directly addresses the concept of intersectionality. For each ism, the individual possesses their experience of injustice increases as a whole. When interconnected, the injustice is in its entirety weighs on the person. Thus, the first participant does not carry any weight. The second carries 20 pounds for the identification of African-American. The third carries 40 pounds for being African-American and lower SES. The fourth runner carries 60 pounds because they are African-American, lower SES, and identify as gay. Lastly, the fifth runner carries 60 pounds because not only is she African-American, lower class and gay, but a woman as well. When one applies the concepts of unearned advantage and conferred dominance, one must look at the first participants. Since he possesses all positive perceived characteristics, his vest is merely weightless material. However, all the other participants unknowingly carry the weight of their diversity. Thus, the first participant has an invisible privilege since he only needs to compete with his own body weight, a privilege for which he is not aware. One can see how racism so clearly implanted in the race as the fifth participant bears a far greater disadvantage than the first participant. The idea of intersectionality and racism may seem diametrically opposed, as inter intersectionality honors our difference, while racism, of course, does not. The multiple identities gay men hold, as a lover, a brother, a father, a son, a sexual minority individual, are a celebration of the intersectionality. Intersectionality informs the ongoing and evolving understanding that gay men is not a gay man, is not a gay man, is not a gay man. We are not a monolith. A gay man holds multiple identities that reflect his understanding of his own race, his own ethnicity, his own culture, his own class, and myriad other aspects of his being, including his sexual identity and gender identity. 
a key element of a set intersectional theory is that the elements of these identities do not exist in isolation, but rather work together to shape how the individual thinks of himself. Race does not exist separately from sexual identity or class or gender identity. Rather, these identities interact and shape the realities and life conditions of a person. These identities cannot easily be split apart. And in that regard, one of the young men I spoke to from the queer generation said, as far as like my identity goes, my queer identity, it's not as bad. It's not really as bad. But then like, then there's like when you're including that with my blackness, it's been pretty rough considering a lot of trans women, black trans women are being killed, being slaughtered, honestly. Like I think the 23rd trans woman was killed recently, like two weeks ago. Segregation and racism are embedded in U.S. history and culture and are also a painful reality of the gay community. The website, www.homohistory.com, is an online archive containing a multitude of photos of gay men and lesbians from throughout history. The images on the site are powerful, beautiful, and haunting. Pictures from the past expressing the sepia-toned love stories between men and women across time and generations. Though many such photos have likely been destroyed or hidden away, those that have been uncovered and shared act as another strong piece of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer history. Reminders of those who have come before us, some of who are proud of their sexual identities, as some who felt the need to cover their true selves from the rest of the world. Behind each photo is an unknown life story, many of which will remain unknown, but will continue to inspire challenge and create a sense of wonder. Unfortunately, these photos are also demonstrative of the painful reality of, gay, of the gay community and that of American society writ large, namely the segregation and racism embedded in U.S. history and culture. It is nearly impossible to find an image on the site that depicts gay men of different races, cultures, or ethnicities, ethnicities together in one photograph. The images show individuals and couples who are practically doppelgangers of each other, much like the nearly all white cast of friends or girls whose main characters, despite living in New York City in the 1990s and 2010s, respectively socialized almost exclusively with individuals of their same skin tone. The images bring to light major challenges that we face as a society as we define who we are, namely intersectionality and racism, both of which shape the coming out process for gay men. Black and Latino sexual minority youth disclose their sexual identities to fewer people than what than white counterparts. Young ethnic minority gay men struggle to negotiate affiliation and loyalty to both their ethnic community and the gay community. Ethnic minority gay men may have trouble coming out since they also may experience heightened discrimination when they disclose their sexual identity. The coming out experience is predicated on all these intersexual identities, race, ethnic background, immigrant experience, and economic class. White gay men from families of means coming out may not be such a challenge. Gay men of color, gay immigrant men, experience various hardships related to their racial backgrounds, their ethnic backgrounds, and cultural backgrounds, and struggles informed by race, ethnicity, culture, and class. This makes the closet a safe place for many men of color and of working class and of immigrant backgrounds. It also may be for some how they develop resilience and empowerment. One of the men with whom I spoke, Juan, said, Juan, who was a Latinx man, said, I actually think it made it harder for white gay men to reconcile their gay identity in a way because it's just like they're not used to feeling left out. They're not used to being stigmatized or depressed. And I like that quote because Juan used his ethnicity as a source of power and a source of pride. In that regard, Miguel, who's 30 years old, said something a little different. Being marginalized across any boundaries is going to make you hyper self-aware of other people's issues. Like if you have lots of things to worry about, chances are you have more profound understandings of how to disentangle those problems and other people because those don't have to deal with the same sorts of issues. Again, the power uh, allowed by having to be challenged, not only because of one's sexual identity, but because of one's culture and one's race and one's ethnicity. Intersectional identities and racism, both outside and within the gay community are intimately linked Individuals who hold intersectional identities related to minority race and gender are not bestowed the same advantages as white gay men. Racism in the gay community is palpable. The oppressed may also oppress. And this type of racism informs the coming out process for many gay men while compounding the feelings of otherness. 
The objectification of gay men of color ingrained within the racism of the community occurs even more easily today with the ongoing development of new dating and hookup apps. App, dating apps. Years of oppression and communities of color within society coupled with the fetishizing and or dismissal of men of color have led to today's divisions. As a consciousness of otherness begins to emerge, especially within the queer generation, the gay community needs to be highly conscious of the otherness we perpetuate within our own populations. We must possess deeper understandings of how race, ethnicity, and intersectionality as a whole play into the experience of young men today. And one young man, Reed, who is Asian, described it as follows. I had just moved to Chicago and went in the bar by myself and got a drink or whatever, and I paid with $20. And he gave me the change back, and I was pulling it away to leave him a cash tip because that's what everybody does. And I heard him turn around to this other bartender and say that, and then he used a bad word to describe a Chinese person, over there didn't leave me any money. Be sure he doesn't get served anymore which I heard just blatantly loud. And so I emailed the management and I said, hey, I want, this I want to use this establishment. I want to come to this establishment. I'm not mad. I will still continue to support you guys being a small business and because of where I live and work in the area. But I just wanted you to know if this happened and that this was said by this person, a bartender. And their email response I got back was, quote, this is the mindset that we have in Chicago. You're going to have to get over it. We must recognize that our battles are ongoing, that the fragility of our rights that we have won over time are very fragile. And wherever we must not forget that our history and name of the efforts of the Stonewall generation to love openly and the A generation to defeat the physical and social and emotional ravages of the virus epidemic continue to this day. The battles and advances of the past have led us to engage in the current dialogue today about intersectionality and gender and race and culture. But we need more than discussions. We need to put into work, we need to put to work efforts to become a community that respects our diversity and seeks to ameliorate the undue stressors that people of color and queer people experience. As the queer generation leads these efforts, it's imperative to remain aware that if we do not collectively support the lives and totality of the LGBT pop population, then we create division within our own population. Those who truly hate us will use this division as an opportunity to chip away at the progress we've made over the last 50 years. I wanna conclude by talking about dignity. Dignity coming out in, in our lives and living one's life with pride is a critical important but it is also about dignity. And I have this quote here of the late, great, notorious RBG who said, when a couple cont contract contracts a bakery for a wedding cake, the product they are seeking is a cake celebrating their wedding, not a cake celebrating heterosexual weddings or same-sex weddings. And that is the service Craig and Mullins, Craig and Mullins were denied. This was, a uh, Supreme Court case about, the, about a baker refusing to make a cake for a same-sex couple. And so these battles continue to this day. Resilience, both as a trait and a dynamic adaptive process is something that we learn to develop. And dignity is an attribute that gay men and lesbians and transgender people and queer people are not given. It's not something we're granted. It is something that we have been earned throughout the course of our lives as we face unknown challenges. The USS Constitution was not, in, was not designed to protect the lives and dignity of LGBTQ people. Many battles were fought as a means to earn our advantage and confer dignity to, to, to our population. The battles manifested in the Stonewall riots of 1969, the 1913 suffrage parade, the Newark Rebellion of 1967, and all of these uprisings that gave voice to those who were oppressed and those who were not given equal rights under the Constitution. I'm going to uh, play this YouTube video for you just to share some more thoughts. San Diego just wrapped up its Pride celebrations, and while June is the designated Pride Month, there's an effort to continue this momentum of acceptance year-round. 
I'm joined now by Dr. Perry Halkidis, who is the Dean of the School of Public Health at Rutgers University and an LGBTQ health researcher. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So as you know, June was selected as Pride Month in part to commemorate the Stonewall Riots. Can you just briefly tell us about that period of time and the significance? June 28, 1969 was a historic day for LGBTQ people. It is the day in New York City at a bar called the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village that LGBTQ people of all races, cultures, sizes, and shapes said to the police, you're not going to arrest us anymore. You're not going to come in and harass us anymore. And there began a multi-day set of riots where LGBTQ people fought the police and demanded that they have the right to love and live their lives openly. And that is marked as the beginning of the LGBTQ civil rights movement, happening at the same time as the African American civil rights movement is, the women's civil rights movement happening, and it is marked, June is therefore marked as the historic um, um, indication of the beginning of LGBTQ pride, and therefore we celebrate pride in June. And you've written a book about this period, and in it you talk about the generational differences between gay men and in what ways would you say a, a gay man's experience today might differ from someone a generation before and even a generation before that? I mean, it would be very easy to say it's easier to be a gay man now than it was 50 or 60 years ago. And in some ways it is. There is There are higher levels of acceptance, although in the last few years that's also been on the downslide. Um, there are more representations in the media of LGBTQ people. However, the feeling that a young person has when they're three or four or five years old, of feeling different, of feeling othered, is pretty consistent across time. And the messages that we receive from society, that all marginalized people receive from society, including gay men, that they are lesser than, permeates every single generation. So I think the psychological process is similar. What is different is the representation of LGBTQ people in our society at large. You write that pride should be celebrated year round. Can you explain why that's so important? What I want is a celebration of every person, of every diverse culture, gender, sexual orientation to fill our history books all year long. Only then do we say, look, America looks like this. Until we change that, America continues to be this sliver of white straight men. And can you tell us about, um, there's a chapter in your book where you touch on substance use and the effect of gay men's health. Um, can you expand on that? Sure. I think that what I've learned over my research program over the last two decades is that when individuals are marginalized, when they are put upon, when they experience stressors, when they experience harassment, they often don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with those negative feelings. Substance use is one way that people, not only gay men, but other folks, ameliorate those feelings, lessen those feelings. The problem is when the substance use gets out of control, it becomes a dependence. So my argument is if you want to get rid of substance use in the gay community, you have to have more tolerance and acceptance and love of LGBTQ people. And how could we as a society promote that? We can promote love and acceptance by just normalizing everybody's lives. So that, that we don't have this idea that an American is one thing. An American is millions of different things. And by reacting in ways that treat everybody on an equal, equal playing field, that's how we normalize people's lives. And that's how we take away the feelings of marginalization that people experience. What needs to be done to really promote this? So we need structural interventions. And we live in, I live in one state and you live in another state that is ahead of the game. California and New Jersey are the two states in the United States that now require that LGBTQ history be taught in schools. When you start at a very young age, when you include the life experiences of Sylvia Rivera and Harvey Milk and all those LGBTQ leaders in the history books from the, and you teach young children at a young age, that's how you change a society. And you know, California and New Jersey, God bless these two states. They are so ahead of the game. Thank you so much. Thank you. Finally, um, I'd like to just put an image up here. These are images of the 23 men who I interviewed for the book, each of, told, each of whom told me their stories. I featured 15 of them, but as you can see, they're a beautiful representation of our society, of the rainbow that 
the that is the pride flag um, and a, a shout out to them for their openness and their willingness to share their stories and often very difficult life experiences with me. I want to thank you for being here with us today. Um, if you want to follow me, that's my Twitter account and that my research center. I also would be remiss not to call out our LGBTQ health concentration at the School of Public Health. There are many certificate programs throughout the country that teach LGBTQ health. We are the first concentration in the world. And also a brand new journal that we have launched over the course of the last two years, the Annals of LGBTQ Public and Population Health. Check these both out and uh, let's keep the lives of LGBTQ people close to our heart and remember Tyler Clemente, especially on this day and every day. Thank you very much. We hope you have enjoyed the first half of the symposium. The event will resume with a live panel following this 15 minute wellness break.
Thank you for joining us for the second half of the Tyler Clemente Symposium. We're moving on to our next session. As people from minoritized backgrounds navigate a society in which discrimination, danger, harm, and violence are present realities, this panel seeks to explore how people from marginalized identities have navigated our society seeking safety and inclusion. To better understand, we will consider the following questions. What has been the purpose and instrumentality of the closet, of passing? What are the costs of the closet? Who pays the costs? How do agency and choice factor into the idea of the closet? During this panel, we'll be joined by Dr. Minion Moore, Ellen L. Short, and Perry Helkitis. Dr. Minion R. Moore is professor of sociology at Columbia University and chair of the sociology department at Barnard College. Her areas of expertise include race, LGBT populations, family, gender, aging, and qualitative research methods. Professor Moore has received grants from the National Institutes of Health, Ford Foundation, Russell Sage Foundation, and the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. Her research has been published in the American Sociological Review, American Journal of Sociology, Gender and Society, Journal of Lesbian Studies, and other outlets. Her first book, Invisible Families, Gay Identities, Relationships, and Motherhood Among Black Women, University of California Press, is a study of same-sex parent families. It won the 2012 Distinguished Book Award from the ASA Sex and Gender section. Her current work examines health and social support for the sexual minority seniors to determine the ways community institutions can better serve them. She is finishing a book titled In the Shadow of Sexuality, Social Histories of African American LGBT Elders, 1950 to 1979. Dr. Moore was recognized by the Human Rights Campaign for her research and service to LGBT communities of color. Currently, she is president-elect of Sociologists for Women in Society. She lives in Harlem with her wife and two children. Dr. Ellen Short is a counseling psychologist and a retired associate professor of graduate counseling programs in the Department of Counseling and School Psychology for the School of Education at Long Island University, Brooklyn. Dr. Short received an MA in counseling psychology from Northwestern University and a PhD in counseling psychology from New York University. Her areas of specialization in teaching, scholarly research, and publishing are group dynamics focusing on race, ethnicity, gender, and culture, social justice, multicultural counseling, and multicultural assessment of intelligence. Dr. Short has spent more than two decades working in the field of group relations and has served as a consultant at group relations conferences in the United States and internationally. She also directed group relations conferences at Teachers College, Columbia University, New York University, and the University of San Diego. She is the author of numerous publications, including the book, Racial and Cultural Dynamics in Group and Organizational Life, Crossing Boundaries, published by SAGE in 2010, and Talking About Structural Inequalities in Everyday Life, New Politics of Race in Groups, Organizations, and Social Systems, which was published by Information Age Publishing in 2016. Dr. Perry Helkitis is a public health psychologist, researcher, educator, and advocate who was Dean and Professor of Biostatistics and Urban Global Public Health at the Rutgers School of Public Health. Dr. Helkitis is the founder and director of the Center for Health, Identity, Behavior, and Prevention Studies.
Good morning. Good morning. I'm Minobung Anna Branch. I have the privilege of serving as the Senior Vice President for Equity at Rutgers University, where I'm also a professor of sociology. I'm delighted to moderate today's panel on shame at the intersections of race, class, gender, and sexuality, featuring Dr. Minya Moore, Dr. Alan Short, and Dr. Pere Halakidis. Welcome panelists. I'm looking forward to a wide ranging conversation on shame, the closet intersectional identity. You collectively reflect such dynamism and intellectual breadth. So let's dive in. So while we're aware of your distinguished accomplishments referenced in your bio, please share what brings you to this work. And if I could, I'd love to start with you, Ellen. Great. Um, you know, I thought about this question and um, in thinking about it, I came up with four things that brings me to this work. The first one is uh, my love as a psychologist of, of the field of psychology. Um, and I think the second one is my love of group dynamics and my endless curiosity about groups and um, group life and some of the really fascinating things that happen in groups in general and how we spend so much time in groups throughout our lives. And we, we really don't necessarily pay much attention to that. So I've always found that really fascinating. Uh, the third thing I, I, I know is my um, identity as a black woman, as an African-American woman and all of the intersectional identities that go along with that, that has really informed my work. And uh, I think the fourth one is just um, always trying to stay um, in tune with the fact that the field of counseling and psychology, although it's done a great deal of good, it's also done a great deal of harm uh, in terms of pathologizing uh, people of color and women. And so um, my commitment to the work is to have a positive impact that in some small way uh, reverses that. And so those are the four things that really bring me to the work and that I feel most passionate about it. And um, I also want to make a contribution um, to the work through my teaching, obviously my scholarship and the consultation work I do for everyone, but particularly for people of color and women. Awesome, thank you so much for that answer. We're gonna be coming back to some of the things you raised. Uh, Mignon, if I can turn to you, I'd love to hear from you. Sure, hello, and thank you again for inviting me to participate in this conversation this morning. Uh, for me, I'd say uh, what brings me to this work is a quest for freedom, uh, for liberation. And uh, within the academy, I'd say the liberation comes from being able to research topics that are of critical importance uh, to understanding uh, the structural position of different groups in society and not marginalizing um, certain groups in our quest for understanding uh, how the social structure sets up inequalities. Um, a liberation of freedom for my people who are Black people uh, to understand how LGBTQ people fit into our racial and ethnic communities. And uh, hopefully through the Academy, other groups will follow course or have followed course or are also doing this work, trying to understand how people can have a racial and ethnic and cultural identity and also have an LGBTQ identity and how, how those things work together for them in different ways. And I guess a liberation of my own, uh, you know, um, being able to be an openly black lesbian woman, a mother, a professor, and have all of those experiences inform um, the work that I do, the types of questions that I bring to my research, right? Perhaps I have a, a particular vantage point that, uh, can be used to understand larger so, uh, sociology, uh, sociological processes 
and um, to, to have a freedom when I walk in a room of not having to hide anything and being able to lay down the unspoken things on the table that can help us move forward. Again, so much richness there that we'll be coming back to. Thank you. Perry, can I turn to you? Absolutely, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and thank you for the opportunity to be with these amazing colleagues. I, I, one of the great privileges of my life is that I'm surrounded by powerful, smart, amazing female-identified people, and one of them is my niece, Sophia Halkidis, who often says, oh, Uncle Perry, um, research is me-search. And I say that because I've spent the last 25 years working on the health of gay men and researching the health of gay men. I am a white gay man who has, you know, lived his life through the last 40 years, unfortunately defined by the lens of AIDS in my population. And I have spent a good deal of my time fighting the battles to try to eradicate this disease, which continues to perpetuate what's going on today. But over the last 10 years, and certainly in the last four years, when I was given the, the platform of being the Dean of the School of Public Health, I felt an obligation, I sensed an obligation to use this platform to speak about the injustices that LGBTQ people face, to speak about the racism that continues to, to exist in the LGBTQ population, to talk about, as I've learned from my dear friend Ellen Short, about how we navigate spaces and respect people's intersectional identities. And importantly for me today, I'm here to honor the life of Tyler Clemente, who is one person in a constellation of millions of LGBTQ people whose lives were taken way too early from us because of societal structures. We find ourselves in this incredibly vulnerable time where our lives are at risk. So as a researcher, I feel it is critical to be here, but as a researcher who is an activist, who wants to demand change, I wanna help move our country forward, move our university forward and move our world forward. So I, I, I'm here for those reasons. Mm. Thank you. Again, such, such brilliant early reflections uh, with so much food for thought for us to follow up on uh, and discuss. Some ways I want to start where you ended, Perry, which is how do we think about Tyler as an individual in a constellation, right? The threads connecting what Ellen talked about in terms of group dynamics and what Mignon talked about in our ability to be open right? And the challenges, in many ways, Tyler's story sets up all of those things. Um, the tensions and the absences of those freedoms and liberation, as Mignon talked about. So whoever wants to kick us off, please do. I, I'm happy to, to, to pick up where I left off, which is, um, um, I think one of the, our challenges moving forward, or our challenges have been for the last forever, you know, is to normalize the lives of LGBTQ people. I often share with my students a story about my brother, a working class mechanic guy from Queens. He's a good guy from Queens, not a bad guy from Queens. Um, <laughs> who, um, when my niece, I come back to my niece again, who I clearly adore, who um, said to, to, to her father, oh, daddy, you know, Uncle Perry sleeps in the same bed with so-and-so. And my brother's reaction was, yes, he does. And that kind of normalization is what we need in our society. I think Tyler's life as a musician and as a student and as a son and as a gay man, right? He, I sense like many gay men, he needed to compartmentalize those identities. And what we need to do and what our challenges are to move forward is to figure out how we allow people to have all of those identities coexist in one space where, they, where in some moments, one part of our identity is more powerful than the other, but never is our identity denied. Mm -hmm. Any of our identities. Excellent. And Mignon, you talked to that beautifully, right? Liberation, freedom, kind of being all parts of yourself. Can you speak to that a bit more? Sure. Uh, when I was um, learning about Tyler's story and the tragedy around that experience, there was just a tragedy on so many levels. And uh, I think that part of our development into full adults is coming to terms with all the different parts of who we are and how we figure that out and how we make our way in the world and what is the context in which we're understanding ourselves and understanding our changing selves. And so, um, you know, there are these different development, developmental um, points in time and 
and uh, you're developing at the same time your peers are developing and they may be at a different place than you. And what do we do with that, right? What do we do when, if you're, you know, 14 year old kid who, who um, thinks of themselves as gay in high school and, and you're in a high school where people just aren't talking about that. How, how do we manage our development in these different contexts when other people just might not have caught up to us yet? Where do we go? Uh, where do we go to reify who we are, to validate who we are, to strengthen who we are? And then what role do we have in helping others, right? There's so many, we could say, well, we don't have to help others. We're focusing on ourselves. Or we could say, well, I'm going to focus on my parents and, and, and <clears throat> helping get to a place, you know, they may not be at a place where I am in understanding sexuality or in understanding who I am, right? You if you you decide if you come out as as gay for example you've been thinking about that for a while but maybe a parent or a best friend hasn't been thinking about it for a while and they may need some time to catch up and what what, what happens in in those moments while you're waiting for them to get to a place where you are and so there are all these different things to navigate all these different um, positions to navigate during certain developmental time so if you move to college years okay we're all you know you know you're in college now you're you're technically an adult but but again you may be in a different place than others and 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 what are the tools to help us to help others get to where we are and to help us be comfortable with who we are and so that's where um institutions come in uh for support where family comes in for support where uh where they're they're even even classes, right? Even classes in school can help uh, support. So um, those are some of the ways that I'm thinking about those ideas. Absolutely, and it's such a beautiful segue to Ellen, right? In the discussion of group dynamics. Uh, so please take it away, Ellen, because I do think you have much to offer here. Oh, thank you, Anna. I, I really appreciate um, Perry and Mignon's uh, comments very much. And, and, and in thinking about Tyler's life and his untimely death. Uh, one of the things that I go to is the collective and issues related to shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. And when I'm speaking about shame and guilt, I'd like to make a distinction. Uh, a colleague and I uh, did a presentation in 2018 and uh, subsequently have written um, a chapter about envy and shame. But we also, uh, in the paper, make the distinction between shame and guilt. And, and, and just really quickly, I'd like to say that guilt is really more of an external uh, dynamic where you say to yourself, I did a bad thing, or I shouldn't have done that, or what I did was wrong. And shame is more of an internal uh, feeling where who you are feels wrong, right? You are made, it is not wrong, but you are made to feel that way by the external environment that you live in, I mean, and all of the external environments that we that we live and, and grow in because there's not just one. And so I think that one of the things that we also really need to look at is the need for groups and organizations and institutions and actually our society to split off parts of ourselves and project them into others um, you know, related to issues of fear, related to issues of needing to feel superior, and um, what the result is with regard to the impact, the devastating impact that, that those types of projections can have on individuals and actually the trauma that is caused by really having the world say to you in, in lots of different ways, you are not enough, and what who you are is not okay. And so I think that it's important to look at all of the spaces that we are embedded in um, and in the ways that we are embedded in their spaces and how shame and guilt can um, escalate to a point that we actually are internalizing those negative things those um, racist things, homophobic things, transphobic things that the, our external environment is always telling us that we need to, 
to uh, be, to change in order to fit in. So I really do think that that's part of the, 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 not just the group dynamic, but the collective societal dynamic that we really need to be looking at in addition to some of the other things that we have to struggle with. So many gems there, uh, Ellen, so many gems. And I, I wanna come back to Perry and Mignon because both of you have, in the course of your research, interviewed gay men, in the case of Perry, in Mignon's case, lesbian women, and the ideas that Ellen talks about in terms of the distinction between shame and guilt, the ways in which who you are is made to not be okay because of the environment. Can you speak to that? Does that ring true with the data and the women and men you've spoken to? I can say something about that. You can hear me over the trucks on Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so in my, in my first book, Invisible Families, Gay Identities, Relationships, and Motherhood Among Black Women, I studied uh, women who were, um, who self-identified as lesbian, gay, bisexual, in the life, or same gender loving, and who were forming families with other women, uh, either through marriages or through um, long-term relationships or through childbearing, or they were single moms who identified in that way. And then in some of my later research, I look at the relationships that Black LGBTQ people have with their racial and religious communities and how they, uh, how they, um, how those identities intersect and what that means for them um, as people who are committed to the racial group. And I really appreciated Ellen's, um, uh, I, wrote, I was taking notes, Ellen, as, as you spoke. Mm -hmm difference between shame and guilt because uh, I could see um, lots of things. One thing I'll just um, point out are age cohort mm -hmm. differences in, in um, this shame. And so the, this project, current project that I'm working on is on elders, um, African-American LGBT elders. So I look at sexuality over the life course among Black LGBT people. And this idea of shame has stuck with many of the older um, Black LGBT people that I have talked mm -hmm. to over the years. This feeling that something is wrong inside of them, but they have mm -hmm. accepted that this is who they are. And it has influenced how they moved around in society um, throughout their years. <laughs> so some talk about how they didn't have children during childbearing years or during the time when people might have children because of this shame, right? They felt that they weren't, uh, they weren't supposed to, they weren't allowed to have children. They weren't allowed to have that component of a life course reflected in them because of who they are. So there's that, that shame. Um, and and what, I, what I've seen with, with younger generations, again, I'm, I'm making a broad generalization because there is still shame, but as we in today's society have, um, uh, a, a different understanding of accepting multiple parts of our identities, there's a different way that that operates. Uh, so for example, in today's society, you can have a white mother and a black father and not be considered black, right? In my father's generation, you had no other choice but to be considered black. Now you might be considered biracial or multiracial, right? We have a different way of thinking about multiple identities. And I think that, uh, mm -hmm also extends to sexuality. Um, there's, there's more of a freedom with some caveats that we can certainly talk about, but there's more of a freedom to have these different parts. Um, whereas with the, with, the, with, the, with the older folks that I interviewed and that I've seen in the archival work, there's been this acceptance that something is, is off, but I'm still gonna go forward and, and, and live the life that I wanna live. Uh, so that's not a full story, but that those are some pieces there. Absolutely. Um, and we have the uh, rich benefit of both you, Mignon, and Perry having done generational work. Wow. So I'm curious, Perry, what do you think in relation? So let me, let me start by saying that, you know, I want to preface my comments by saying I am a white gay man of privilege, mm -hmm. right? And so my life experience is shaped by those identities. Mm -hmm. And even I, as a white gay man of privilege, 
experience shame every single day of my life um, because of generational effects, what have you. What I, what, I, what I love about Mignon's comments, and I think there are real, there are differences across the generations. I think that the younger generation, the generation that I refer to in the book um, as the queer generation, uh, are able to verbalize these experiences of shame about the multiple identities that they hold in their lives in a way that my generation and the generation that preceded me did not. Mm -hmm. And I think there is an empowerment in the ability to verbalize that. There is an empowerment to stand up and say, I can be gay and black and exist in this world, right? Mm -hmm. I can be you know, uh, female identified and Latina, Latinx and a dean of a school at the same time. And that's what I think is different, right? But the shame never really goes away because you, from a young age, I believe, and this is something I've learned from my friend Ellen Short here, is that we experience this feeling of otherness, right? You know, anybody who is LGBTQ, anybody, anybody who's a member of any marginalized population, it feels othered. And that, what goes on from zero to five, stays with you throughout your life. So I will tell you very frankly that when I first got to Rutgers a few years ago, there was a lot of turmoil in me internally. Because after 20 years at NYU, where I was an openly gay man, where everybody knew who I was, I felt like I had to, become, I had to come out of the closet again and again and again and again. At 53, it was a little easier than 23. But still, the experience harkened back to those really traumatic events in my life where I needed to disclose my identity in every context that I navigated. So, you know, shame is still there. And unfortunately, there are individuals in our society and in our political system who intentionally try to shame us because of who we are. Mm -hmm. Beautiful answer and, and so many pieces, so many threads. I have notes here trying to pick up all the threads. Uh, so uh, feel free to uh, jump in if there's like, oh, there's something you want to talk about that you want us to pick up on. But one of the things, Perry, that I'm thinking about in relation to your comments, connecting with Ellen's and Jan's, is to take us toward a conversation about visible and invisible identity. Because we are very much talking about the ways that um, gay identity joins with other identities that create real similarities in experiences and ways that, uh, if I pick on racial identity, shape the experience of gay identity. But that story you told, Perry, of coming back out again, right? And you mentioned this in your talk as well about, and you challenged beautifully in your talk, heterosexuals to imagine what it meant to come out over and over again. That's different for gay identity. Right, and an invisible identity. When I walk into a room, I'm a black woman. There's no question, right? There, there, there's, in my instance, um, there's less ambiguity. So can we talk about that for a minute? What does this visible and invisible identity have to do with kind of otherness, right? When we think about what, what, what it means and how we move through space. Can I, 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 I thank you for raising that. And I think this like, so I want, I'm going to first, let me, I want to add something that I actually wanted to say before and I just want to understand. On what you said, which is, you know, for me, this, feel, this, this feeling of shame and loneliness and marginalization that LGBTQ people experience and people of all marginalized identities experience are so linked to our health, mm. right? And so, you know, I'm RBHS right now. So to think that HIV is by chance happening in gay black men, it's ridiculous. It's not happening by chance. It's because gay, black gay men are experiencing multiple stressors in their lives, living in contexts that perpetuate discrimination on many fronts, and they are more at risk for engaging in risk behaviors that perpetuate HIV, right? So it's like nobody wakes up one morning and says, you know, I'm an, I want HIV, or I want to be a meth addict, or I want this. I, I, I'm, I'm over this behavioral stuff. Um, but you know, you, you allude to something in your, in your question, which, you know, I want to sort of redirect and talk about this idea of like passing, mm -hmm. right, right, okay. and the dangers of passing and the, also the benefits of passing, right, and so I can pass as a white straight man, right, and I have used that maybe to my own harm over the course of my life in order to navigate spaces, and for other folks who don't have my skin tone, who don't have my, you know, body type, it's much more difficult to pass. And so what I think is really incredible about the younger generation, I think Mignon, again, referred to this like wonderfully, is that 
um, many of them don't want to pass, mm. right? And they refuse to pass or to cover, right? And so what we need to do is, so they've got the tools, we've got to work on our institutions mm. that allows individuals who are diverse in these multiple fronts, <laughs> who like, you know, like I, I write in the book, about about Yao, which is and even even my own like issues around this stuff. Yao, Ghanaian man, strapping big, walked into the interview room, right, sat down, and he had the most beautiful yellow polished nails in, I'd ever seen in my life. And I was taken aback mm -hmm. because that was my own stuff about gender identity that was coming out in that in, in that interview. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm feeling that, right, me. Mm -hmm. um, I can't imagine what's going on, you know, to, in his experience in the rest of the world. So the change has to happen. Yes, it's happening internally for us. It has to happen institutionally. Mm. Nothing will get better. So much yeah. we're gonna come back to both sides. Go ahead, Ellen. No, I, I, I just wanted to connect with what uh, Perry is saying uh, uh, because I, I'm really glad that you brought in, 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 in the construct of passing um, because, you know, one of the things that I, I've been thinking about and have thought about for a long time is obviously we need, we, we think that we need passing. We, we, we need to pass in all the different kinds of ways that we do because society tells us that we have to be a certain way in order to get a certain thing and to have a certain kind of life, right? And, you know, like, what is the function of it? It, it? It's based on oppression. It's based on all the isms. It's based on patriarchy. And I think that it is important. And I do get what you're saying about the younger generation not wanting to pass and not feeling the need to do that. But I also think that there is still a societal message that holds out the promise. And it is a false promise that if you speak a certain way and you have a certain amount of education and you dress a certain kind of way um, and all of the ways that, you know, Carrie, that you were talking about that one can present oneself to pass in, in various different kinds of environments, that you can have those things mm -hmm. that our country in particular promises people that they are supposed to be able to have. And we know that that's not true just on the basis of people who have black and brown skin who can have all of those wonderful things and all of those wonderful attributes and still be uh, assaulted uh, by the police, uh, uh, accused of criminal behavior by a passerby who happens to be white. Uh, you know, so, so I mean, there is, there is that as well uh, in terms of, I, I think that that's the that's the false promise of passing that's the lie of passing but then i also think that there is an i'd like us to in in some ways think of passing and also even sometimes closeting behavior as adaptive mm -hmm. you mentioned that so you know i think of it as adaptive everybody does it we all do it and sometimes we do it because um we need to get through the day right we need to get through the day without having a microaggressive incident. We need to get through the day and do our job or go to school or whatever it is that we're doing, take care of our families and come home at night safely. Mm -hmm. And that's why we, you know, we do it voluntarily or involuntarily because you can't control what people think you are and what, you know, and, and again, the projections that people have of you. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, you know, on that continuum, we do it to save our lives. Mm -hmm. So I do think that one of the things that we really need to do is, is, is re and, I, and, I, and I'm sure that there is uh, research being done on this. I, it's not the research that I do. I, I tend to focus more on group dynamics in relation to those things. But I think that there, there does need to be more of an examination of passing, not necessarily being pathological and closeting behavior, not necessarily being in any way uh, disordered or pathological, even though it may come from trauma but that it is also adaptive to the human being, to the human experience to do it. So that's, that, that's something that I really feel strongly about. You know, I don't mean to interject, but I just want to add something really quickly to what Ellen said, because I'm 100% on board with what, what you were saying, Ellen, and I think you're right, passing pa cuts both ways, right? And I want to mm -hmm. also just, you know, think about Pete Buttigieg for a second, right? Mm -hmm. He was gay, but not that gay. 
right? And I, you know, and I say that as a gay man, right? So because he was not that gay, right? He could run for president of the United States, right? And that's the society we live in. And that's why Pete stayed in the closet till he was like 30 years old. And that's why he continues to try to navigate spaces and past. And I do the same thing. But again, and one of my last comment is, let's recall and let's, and I hope we go through this deeper. There are many people in our world who don't have the privilege of the closet, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. who can feel safe. And, and there are many people in the world who unfortunately are forced out of the closet because others victimizing behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I have a, a comment that is a little, uh, a little bit different. Go for it. Uh, thinking about intraracial dynamics. So mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. do you um, experience being LGBTQ in your racial and ethnic community. Mm -hmm. And I have an example from my research that I think would be of interest. Please. So in some of the work I did in Los Angeles, uh, I was examining how um, an organization form called Black Game Here to Stay. And it was um, younger people, I'd say in their 20s and 30s, who were going to march uh, as part of a, a, a series of protests going on at the time. They were going to, to march as an openly gay um, organization in the in the um, Martin Luther King Day parade, right? So many cities have a parade like this. It's a, it goes through black neighborhoods, and this will be the first time in this yearly parade that goes down Crenshaw. We're going to have these signs up, you know, with to to acknowledge these people as as black and gay. And um, so I followed this group over two years. And uh, with people, we, you know, we talked about the different things that people expected and, and what they found. And so one thing that I think is relevant here is the visit is becoming visible within your ethnic community, the fear in that, and how sometimes the community is accepting and sometimes it's not accepting. And so there are examples in this research where it's not accepting, where people are threatening physical harm. And then there are times when people are accepting, uh, such as in this March. This was right after Obama was elected. There was a lot of unity that day. And I wanted to share with you what a young woman said, you know, in, after the March, um, if I can share, I'll be able to share the screen. So she says, in, in, in this March, there was still, can, can you see it? Yep, we can. There was still some part of me that felt a little bit of fear She's talking about marching openly down Crenshaw with these signs. Mm -hmm. maybe, be, maybe it was a bit of shame in the moment because I think I have come so far, but then you have to confront them, meaning other black people. I think it's a beautiful thing when people can get past their internal homophobia and your internal shame that you don't think still needs to be cleansed and thrashed out and put back together. Mm -hmm. She says, these pe those, those people out there, a lot of times are our friends and family members, cousins, people we are going to see tomorrow night. We have to deal with the fact that we are now representing this facet of the community, right? So it's this, they're not saying we're going to, we're representing this other group. They say, well, we're representing this part of who we all are as a collective. And then she ends with, that's just, I am happy to grow. Mm -hmm. So I share that because, you know, these are, these are the things that people are negotiating when, um, when I don't want to say demanding acceptance because it sounds really aggressive, but just insisting that this is that that we are part of this community and yeah. and this is part of who we are. And just like you want us to help um, advocate for the new science center for high, you know, for for children after high um, after school because the children need a science center. And and I don't have any children, but as a member of this community. Um, you know, I want more more programs for Black children. I want you. I want you to now help advocate for me when I want um, when I need some resource that relates to my um, my sexuality. And so it's this negotiation mm -hmm. that's taking place in the, in the process of becoming visible that I think is important here. So just brilliance all around um, from all of you that I so appreciate. We're talking about passing visible and invisible identity, notions of the closet broadly, but I want us to talk about the closet like as, as a construct uh, really concretely for a moment because it's coming up. Um, but, but let's talk, the, the symposium is called Life After the Closet. 
um, in particular. And there's an image pairing your talk where you have a black girl peeking from behind a door where there's a rainbow behind her. Um, that I thought was really illustrative. And in the image for this talk, we've got an open door with a rainbow um, coming out. But this this choice of kind of how we negotiate the closet and Mignon, what I heard in that quote was Sister Muhammad, I believe, was her name talking about being in the community, but choosing to prior to holding up that sign, being a member of that community in a closeted form, right? And so what is the utility, right, of the closet? She's offering one and, and is raising kind of the challenges of coming out, but, but let, let's have that conversation. What's the role of the closet in terms of how people choose to use it? Ellen, you said before that rather than thinking about it as pathological, that we can think about it as adaptive. So if we go with that frame, there are protective elements, there are oppressive elements. How do we think about that? How are you all thinking about that in the context of your work? Please. Um, I, I think I would say that I want to refer to um, Anna, the article that you uh, sent yeah. us. Please, go for it. Um, yeah, I thought it was really interesting. The author was um, sort of in this sort of nostalgic way, um, even though um, he understood the consequences of closeting himself and the trauma that um, he, well, the trauma always comes before the behavior in, this, in, in what we're talking about, but the, the consequences of that uh, closeting behavior. But, but what I really thought was so interesting about it was just the reflection of it. Mm -hmm. And um, then coming to his realization through, he did sort of like a little qualitative study mm -hmm. in reaching out to other men um, who wore they themselves closeted. You know, coming to the conclusion at the end of the article that, yeah, there might be some things that I think I missed, but maybe I'm just fantasizing about mm -hmm. that because the consequences of it are so great that um, I'm better out. I'm better the way that I am. I'm better being authentically who I am. And I want to say, um, I think just to add on to what we've been talking about, I, I wanted to, and, and this might be a little bit heavier, but uh, I think, uh, you know, what, what Mignon shared in terms of the community and, and becoming more visible in one's community by being authentically who um, a person is that particular uh, sister Muhammad, who she was. Um, I think that there's also things that we have to think about with with relation to intergenerational mm -hmm. issues related to trauma and also very much related to um, closeting behavior. So, for example, one of the things that's coming up for me is you know you, you know how sometimes you ask your I don't know if you, if, you, if you know this, but sometimes you can ask a client or a patient to do a genogram mm -hmm. of their lives and um, you can have different themes for genograms. So I was thinking how useful it might be, you know, in therapy, for example, uh, which we haven't really talked very much about yet, mm -hmm. uh, for clients or patients to create genograms of if they are aware of it, positive behavior mm -hmm. in, let's say, three generations of their family or more that they might be aware of, in addition to thinking about the community um, and in addition to thinking about the utility of the closet, what are the intergenerational consequences of it as well? Absolutely. That's, I want to give the, before uh, Perry and Mignon, you jump on in here, I just want to give the audience context for the article that Ellen's referring to. So I shared a piece with the panelists um, written by Drew Nellen Smith, and it's just a public article written for Vice called, What I Miss About Being in the Closet. And he says, life after coming out of the closet is sometimes harder than you'd anticipate. But he poses a question, does it negate the pain of staying closeted? And in the article, as Ellen really excellently described, comes to the conclusion, no, right? It doesn't negate the pain. I, I actually am okay with this. So we'll make sure we share that out on our social media uh, channels uh, under the hashtag Life After the Closet. Then Jan Perry, please take the question. Yeah, we stay in the closet because sometimes we have to protect our lives. And I, um, mm -hmm. 
you know, I'm going to tell you uh, about a year ago, and this happens to me still, right? And, you know, look at me. I mean, like, and, you know, all the check boxes should say that everything should be easy in my life, right? But I got into an Uber to go, I don't know, somewhere because I'm lazy and I always take an Uber everywhere. And, you know, and, you know, the Uber driver was, you know, carrying on about his wife and his kids and blah, 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 and asking me about wife, my wife and kids. And I didn't correct him, right? Mm-hmm. I recloseted myself. Mm. I recloseted myself mm-hmm. because at that particular moment, it felt safer to me as this man was driving to do that. And mm-hmm. so the closet is a pain. And, and then afterwards, I was just like beating myself up, right? Because of why did I do that, right? But I, I, I think sometimes I, I would like us to be in a society where we don't ever have to do that. But unfortunately, that's not the society that we're in. The pain of being in the closet is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly powerful. But for many of us, it also is a lifeline. Mm -hmm. And so let's see how we can ultimately get rid of the closet so we don't need to go back into it. But don't just get pull the bandaid off right now because a lot of people need the closet to survive. Thoughts about this that are um, not so much an either or being in, in a closet or out of a closet, but more, uh, and this is coming from the experiences I've had with with my the people that I've written about and studied and talked to. When uh, uh, when to share? Mm. Right? I mean, I. I could imagine a straight person in that Uber not sharing just because they don't want to share. Mm-hmm. They don't want to talk to this person. Right. Um, you know, I, um, maybe there's a fear connected to safety if it's a woman or maybe not. But um, when I think about, uh, there's an 83 year old man in my book that I'm working on now, a, a black man who has lived through everything that a, a black gay man would have lived through in, in New York. Uh, he was one of the men who used to roller skate, you know, back in the 70s when you'd see a bunch of uh, guys up and down Manhattan on roller skates. He was part of that group. And in my family, it's noteworthy because um, he's my uncle. He uh, was a vegetarian in, in a Southern family where people just did not eat meat <laughs> in the 60s and 70s. Just when you went to your grandmother's house, you just ate whatever she cooked. And um, so anyway, it, with him, he's never said to his family that he's gay. He's just never said that. Mm. We all know that he's gay. And um, he makes little subtle references, but he has never said it. And what does that mean, right? Does that mean he's in the closet? Mm-hmm. Um, I've been trying to work on this concept uh, of what it means and how you express your sexuality and what it means for different generations and what it means in different moments, in different moments in a, in a temporal sense, whether it's late at night or, or on a Sunday morning, you're going to get bagels, what it means in historical sense, right? In different communities and different eras, um, but even for um, what it means for you as, as, as a person and understanding your power. So I have a chapter in my first book, Invisible Families, that is called um, Coming Into the Life. And I I talk about, it's not called Coming Into the Life, but it's about not coming out of the closet where you say to your mother at Thanksgiving, I am gay, I'm a lesbian, Um, but coming into an understanding of what that means in um, a particular cultural context. And so for these women, it's about what, what it means to come into the life, come into the life of um, a black lesbian in in New York in the 70s or 80s. And, and all that means culturally, which um, what, what kind of socializing you do, what kind of people you meet mm-hmm. um, and how you combine that new world of other same gender loving people with the world that you already know, which is the music and the dancing and the hair styles and the clothes and, and bringing those things together to create something that is, that is um, felt deep inside that comes from years of 
of a cultural or historical experience. And then also um, being able to be free, freer in, in who you love. And so um, that's another way to think about this rather than coming out, coming into a life that has these, has these um, different components that allow all of these things to come together in interesting ways for you. Yes, absolutely. I, I see you, Perry. I was coming to you next uh, because in uh, Perry's uh, brilliant talk earlier, he talked about the unspoken telling, if I'm recalling that correctly. So please, Perry, say yeah, more. No, I'm, 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 look, I, I was listening to Mignon thinking like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, can we just power, panel just go on for hours and hours and hours? <laughs> um, you know, you know, unspoken, you know, like, I, I used to think in my research, you know, 10 years ago, that if you didn't, you know, verbally come out and say, I'm gay, that that was going to ultimately have like very negative health consequences for you. And I'm not convinced of that anymore. And I think there's enough research out there to indicate right now that for some people, like, like, like Mignon's uncle, I think you said Mignon, or my husband, Bobby, who is, you know, white, working class, Irish Catholic from Long Island, and notice I said Long Island, um, <laughs> that he never told his parents, right? And is he any less psychologically or physically or socially healthy than I am? I don't know. And I think that we need to uh, 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 disentangle that. The other thing I, I would like to say to Mignon's comment, and I think it, it, that, that she expressed so brilliantly and wonderfully is, it's not a dichotomy. Right, it's actually like this, like this mm -hmm. continuum, right? And I float across this continuum. Sometimes I'm really out of the closet, and I'm a little bit in the closet. And you know, like every context we navigate, that's that context in some ways shapes the way we present ourselves to that the, the people in that environment. I would hope that increasingly, as time goes on that one part of our identity or the, those identities that we seem to have some shame about, make, we feel safer expressing them in more environments than in, than in ones right now. So, so last, la last comment here, like, you know, um, would I hold my husband's hands in certain sections of Queens, New York? No. Because I, I think like if I were to go there, because I would be afraid. Would I hold his hand, you know, in you know, um, in uh, in the West Village in Manhattan? Y yes, I would. But I, 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 I give that as an example again because I don't want us to diminish, like recloseting ourselves, because I think sometimes we need to do it in order to survive. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that takes me to another place. If you permit me to go completely left here for a moment. Let's think about the ways that other groups, non-gay groups, right? The ways that we associate the closet with LGBT identity. What in a fictional world might other groups desire a closet? And so I'm thinking about black men's interaction with the police, right? The ability to no longer be seen, right? To be perceived as less of a threat in that moment, right? Might we see it as beneficial? So and you know, play with the metaphor the way that you'd like, but in some ways, if we take the notion of the closet, the kind of adaptability, the ability to survive that it offers and apply it to a very different kind of context, what might happen? Anna, can you repeat what you said about your example? I didn't quite hear it. What okay. was the example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I was saying is you permit me you, you can't hear me, Mignon, either? Well, it, when you were describing it at a point, it went out, so I couldn't hear it either. Oh, okay, okay. Um, what I was saying is if you permit me a, to go left, to draw a really um, uh, alternate universe example here, and I'm saying imagine the closet and separate the closet from the notions of LGBT identity and apply it to another identity, a more visible identity. For instance, interactions of Black men with the police. Right, might the notion of a closet, the ability to mask your identity in moments of safety um, be applicable, right? Might it be protective and clarify some of the things we're talking about now? That's a, uh, uh, I, I remember you did ask that question in your email and I, I, I thought about it. Um, and it does take me to um, 
a couple of places, but uh, one is that I think that black and brown people, it's not that they have tried to mask their identities, but they have tried to, in different ways, present themselves in such a way that they would not be thought of, you know, in negative ways by uh, the dominant culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I'm thinking of, um, and I'm a little hesitant to say this because I would, I need to have a little bit more context to explain it. But what I will say, because you're asking us to be creative and you're asking yeah. us to think um, in a different way. Uh, I teach a multi, or I taught a multicultural counseling course for many years. And in that course, um, I signed three papers to my students and they were graduate students. They were preparing to become counselors and marriage and family therapists and school counselors and mental health counselors. And um, the third paper was a paper in which I asked them to imagine uh, that they went to sleep one night and they woke up uh, the next day um, and that they were uh, in a different identity intersectionally, right? And I gave them choices, but I didn't restrict them to any particular uh, type of identity or any particular choice. Um, I just wanted them to write a paper about what their identity would be and what it told them about themselves in, you know, as who they are, right? And so most of my students were students of color, um, primarily women of color. And generally speaking, two things would happen. Um, many of the students of color, particularly the black women, were not able to, chose not to change themselves mm -hmm. and change their identities. And they were very, very, very clear about why they chose not to do it. That, you know, they talked about how proud they were of being black women and how, how it was important for them to uh, be loyal to their identity and to um, not wish to be anything other than what they are despite the messages that they're constantly receiving. Um, by society. And then there were, then there were some students who would take um, the fantasy and wish to be white, right? Um, and they had a lot of different fantasies about what it would be like to be white and how much privilege they would have and what they could do with that whiteness and what it would be like. And so the paper was uh, really, really interesting um, from, from that uh, perspective and, 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 and particularly what it told them about themselves and the fantasies that they had about who they were and um, who they thought the other was. And there were occasionally men who, uh, very few, but occasionally some men in my class also fantasized about being uh, women and what that meant and what that would be like for them. So, I mean, your question makes me think about that. And then the last thing I'll say, your question makes me think about other identities. Like, for example, I am a cisgender, heterosexual, Black, African-American woman who is not married, who is single, who is self-supporting, who has chosen consciously not to have children. So, for example, those are some of my identities that people make assumptions about all the time mm. with regard to uh, my status. And, you know, I don't always think of it as, as, as being closeted, but you know, as Perry was saying, if I get into an Uber with somebody who starts talking about whatever, their partner and their children and this and that and the other, and you know, I don't, I mean, I get it, but I don't really necessarily relate to it mm -hmm. in a real way. I, you know, more than likely don't say, I, I mean, sometimes I just don't want to get into it and I don't say anything, mm -hmm. right? Very often I'm in a group of people who go on and on and now it's grandchildren. First it was children and now it's grandchildren. They go on and on. And I, you know, listen, I have nothing against that, but they go on and on and on and on about their, their offspring, right? Their children. And I, I think that's wonderful. But again, I've actually taken to saying I do not have any children by choice. Uh, because there are also assumptions made about that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is my life and this is the way that I live my life as, a, as, a, as an African-American woman, mm -hmm. uh, middle-aged African-American woman. So 
th yeah, so that's where I, I'm sorry to take so long, but that's oh, no. where I, I went with your question. Oh no, I mean, great, great directions. And it's kind of the beauty of it is that you really do get to take it where you want it to go. Who's up next? Tell me how you, how you enter the twilight zone I've offered. I was so appreciative of Ellen's remarks because as you asked that, Anna, I was thinking, I just don't, I just, I don't know. I mean, I feel like the black women who were students in Ellen's class, um, theoretically, I could see how you might want to hide a, a stigmatizing identity in, 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 in a, a context where that identity can end up threatening your life. But I can't see that I would do it if I had, I don't know that I would, I would have a hard time thinking through how to imagine this. Maybe I would need to go to sit in therapy with Ellen and figure, <laughs> figure this out. Um, <laughs> the, thing I did, the thing I did think about though was um, the ways that Black, sometimes, and this is just one example, Black middle-class people try to destigmatize their racial identity by playing up a class identity. And I would say in my, in my life, and now Ellen, I'm gonna talk about my children, <laughs> which is, I'm gonna try not to talk okay. about them, but it's relevant in this context. <laughs> um, my wife and I, we're both black women. We have two black children and we live in Manhattan and our children happen to go to, not happen, they go to independent schools, to private schools. And I, and I wrote about the process of applying to private schools for them and trying, um, I, I mean, I don't have to do much to play up my class identity because I can talk about my, my what I do for work, but, um, but I think this, this idea about a, having a way to destigmatize an identity could, certainly comes into play there because we have these identities as lesbian, we're, op we're openly a two mom family, we're, we're, we're brown, right? We're not wealthy, right? Mm -hmm. we, we have some means, but we're not wealthy. And so what do we, how do we compensate, right? Maybe we, you know, um, do other, sh show in other ways how similar we are to, to some of the parents that might also be attending these schools. And so I don't think that's closeting, but and it just made me think about how people might in the in an example of, of of the context that Anna describes with the police, try to try to destigmatize or, or create another way for that group to see see the group, see your group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and I, I, I'm so grateful for this conversation. Again, I can't thank you enough. But I want I want to veer it a little bit in a little slightly different direction, which is to bring it back to the LGBTQ population. And then I think it's very easy for us. Well, first of all, let's let, let's all start from the place that I'm. We're all sick and tired of hearing the term LGBTQ and thinking that it's a monolith. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm just over that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we're not just one thing. There's not just one Greek. There's not just one African American. I mean, it's like this notion that we have to all be in this box, and all of us are in that box are the same somehow. It's just completely despicable to me, and I'm over it. Um, I want to say that. Um, uh, with regard to the, that we also need to think about the stigmatization and the othering of race that also goes on within the population, mm -hmm. right? So there is a, often in my own work, I have found this fetishizing and this like labeling that goes on of men of color, whether they're Asian men or Latin X men or black men by white men. And this is, a, to me, a perpetuation of, you know, societal images of what it means to be a Black man, right? And so the work that we have to do as a society in terms of, you know, navigating spaces where Black men interact with police, right, also translate to the work we have to do with spaces in the, in the, in the gay population with gay, Black men navigating gay communities, right? So, you know, I go every weekend because in some ways I'm incredibly stereotypical to my place on Fire Island, right? And there's like a bunch of white guys, right? The, the Pines Mignon, the, you know, and then you go to Cherry Grove 
right? <laughs> I know you don't appreciate that. And you go to Cherry Grove and it's not a bunch of white guys, right? And there's just like this segregation that goes on even within the population itself. So, so um, you know, uh, or we think about the other stigmatization that goes on, of me as an older man or somebody as an potentially slightly overweight man or somebody as a, a slightly sh shorter individual. And those kinds of isms that that gay men and lesbians and trans folks experience from society at large exist in our society, in our own population. And I'll tell you with this long last thing, about two years ago, and this is, the, this is always it blows my mind. Two years ago, I wrote a, an editorial for the New York Star Ledger calling out the racism in the LGBTQ population. And when I went to work the next day, people said to me, I had no idea. Like, what do you mean you had no idea? Like, you know, LGBTQ people are people too, right? And like, they're racist, right? And so this notion that somehow, if you're in a marginalized population, you don't marginalize is absurd. So mm -hmm. um, it would be easy in my life to blame like the white straight men for everything, and I often do, um, but sometimes there's also work to be done internally within our own population, right? To deal with the, 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 the marginalization and the oppression and the recloseting we do to each other. Just so thoughtful. One of the reasons I asked you that question is uh, mind bending as it was, because I think that when you consider um, a question like the closet in a completely different context, it makes other things clearer. And so in your answers, what you made clear were the elements of the closet that other groups find, or, or the conditions, I should say, um, that make choosing the closet not an option. And so for the Black woman in your example, Ellen, it was a sense of um, deep pride, ownership, uh, belief, a kind of cultural belonging that was like, I absolutely don't want to give that up. Um, right. And in the case, if I go back to Mignon's earlier example of kind of coming into the life, right, that, that, that the not one. So there, there had been a kind of um, cohesion, right, if you will, this, this greater acceptance that um, the closet would remove that. So, the, so what you lost as a result of choosing the closet then is much clearer. And so if we go back to where we started in some ways around why people choose the closet, it makes clearer the absence of that for so many. Ellen, you were gonna say something before. Um, just to, to, to just to connect with what you're saying, Anna, and, and what Perry and Mignon and I've been been talking about. This is I have this is just I, I love this show, so I have to say it um, because it fits in exactly with what we're talking about. I've been watching um, Lovecraft Country um, on HBO, <laughs> and oh, so Randy and Anna, do you, have you been watching? I've heard yeah. lots about it, but I have not watched it yet. Okay, the, I tell you, some of the episodes really delve into what we've been talking about today, mm -hmm. about identity, passing, and closeting behavior and trauma, mm -hmm. racial, mm -hmm. racialized trauma, mm -hmm. um, what Janet Helms would call, um, you know, ethno violence um, mm -hmm. and intergenerational trauma due to racism, but also the fantasy, because it's black uh, science fiction. Mm -hmm. right? I'm not really into science fiction, so I needed this podcast that explain, you know, what certain things are afterwards. But um, if you know, if you think about Get Out and Us yes. with Jordan Peele, it's in that it's in that genre, yep. right? Yep. And so I'm just I'm, I'm I'm just so resonant with it right now with this conversation. I encourage you, if you all have time, to check it out because it really does, and it also speaks to. Um, uh, gay men in particular and uh, closeting identity and race mm. and it's very powerfully done so it's 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 an excellent series i really like it so i just wanted to 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 say that because it's making me think a lot right now about what i've seen on that show we're talking about absolutely mignon i see you smiling what are you thinking about <laughs> no, no, no. Thing I, I keep wanting to watch it <laughs> now, now you have an academic reason you must connect it to your body of research to enlighten the masses but, 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 but you know ellen points to like this reality right which is like art always is ahead of the game right like art like you know we need art to show us the way and then we as scholars eventually catch up and then you know i guess scientists and then society catches us so you know 
this is, you know, what I think is so great about, and I don't have to do a pitch for our university for a second here, right? What's so great about our university is this is ability to do this really, really interdisciplinary work, right? Because when you bring Mason Gross and the School of Public Health together and psychology together, then you get to something that's really a reflection of these multiple disciplines working to understand humanity. And I think the arts just do that really, 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 really well. Absolutely. And I think that the, and I, and I love the concrete illustration, Alan, of what my, uh, question tried to do in a much more um, amateur sense, right? Which is let's shift gears for a moment and think about something in a way we wouldn't normally think about it and see what it shows us, right? Because our, the ways of, uh, the are typical ways, the way that we began our conversation, understanding the closet, and in some ways the ways of the public narratives around the closet are kind of oversimplified. This conversation alone has kind of deepened and exposed contours in the way that we think about um, understand the closet um, that I just think are so incredibly rich. But we've got a little bit more time and I want to take us in the somewhat different direction, if you would, going back to where we started. And I want to draw on a bit of all of your opening comments about what brings you to this work, but I'm going to go in order. Because I want to start with Ellen, but you started by talking about the ways that counseling and psychology has at times pathologized and kind of the consequences of that kind of pathologization and the goal to interrupt that. And so I want to pose a question to the group around uh, what does it take then drawing, knowing that that is our historical context, knowing that society in many ways has that consequence. Um, what are the strategies? Um, what are the ways that campus and society more broadly um, need to shift to become a place that enables people to thrive more broadly? So knowing that's our history, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think just using uh, sorry, Alan Spiegel and just using the example of um, the field of counseling and psychology. Wait, we lost you for a second, Alan. Classes uh, and my Hold on, oh. one Ellen, can you start again? Can you we hear me now? You. We lost you for a second. I think you're coming back though. Yeah. Yeah, because I had a phone call. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Okay. I think um, institutions and organizations and um, particularly academic institutions, if, if I want to make a parallel to the field of counseling and psychology, need to try to focus on reparative work. I mean, the only reason that we have multicultural counseling and harm on Alan, we're losing some of your, uh, your audio clarity. Color. Alan, can you hear me? We're okay. losing your audio clarity. Can you try turning off your video for a moment and seeing if that lets us hear oh. you better? Oh, sure. Sure. Let me see if I can do. Is that better? Oh. So we can still see your video. I'm not sure if you turned it off. Okay. Can you try talking one more time? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. I'm sorry about that. Um, let, me, let me start the video again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I just really was just trying to say, to make a parallel uh, um, to, to the field of or to think about before levels of embeddedness and systemic resistance, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, just to say really quickly, uh, levels of embeddedness really have to do with all of the levels that a particular academic institution is embedded in, for example, uh, geographically, in, in terms of the community, in terms of historical significance. What is, 
what is the university's relationship to, to history? For example, we know that there are many academic institutions that have relationships to slavery, mm-hmm. right? And enslavement. And um, the, their very existence in some cases is owed to um, the horrors of slavery. So, so you know, that's, that's a historical significance and a layer of embeddedness that needs to be focused on. And um, in terms of the systemic resistance, I just think it's really important to understand that systems resist change. I mean, you know, we can kind of talk about it and academic institutions are really good about making mission statements, which are really important and having committees, which are also really important and hiring people who um, focus on those particular issues, diversity, inclusion, um, equality, all of those things. Um, But I think implementing them and understanding that they will be resisted because people fear the change that they bring is really important. Sorry for all of the interference with the internet, but that's that's kind of um, what I wanted to say about that. No problem, we got you. Other takes, Perry, Mignon, and I can give you the prompt again if you need it or, or just dive in. Well, I was thinking about Ellen's comments and um, and Columbia, where I work, and I work also at Barnard College. Um, uh, and it is very hard to change the culture of an institution. It takes a very purposeful acts. <laughs> and, you know, even then, there are just so many forces working against that that the change is incremental and usually comes at great cost and often comes in a moment of crisis where you're just forced to do something because it, you know because structures especially you know people who are advantaged by them aren't they're reticent to give them up and they just don't see why you need to change or they just agree with the need to change and so um, i think I've tried to approach change kind of in an, by you, in my work, I've tried to approach change by using mainstream methods to study a marginalized population and uh, thereby allowing people who have no interest in the population to still see the sociology in the work, to value the sociology in the work, and then to use that as a way to change, um, to move forward a body, a, a subfield several subfields in my discipline. Mm -hmm. Um, When I think about Columbia and the reticence of Columbia to change um, from white male dominance, I see the students who just think differently. And I was was an undergraduate at Columbia. And I think that the students in this generation are saying, we don't care. We don't care about the history. We want it to change. We think this is wrong. We want it to change. Whereas in my generation, we said, yes, this is horrible. Is it, you know, all of this focus on European history is is terrible and we wish there was something else. These students are saying, oh no, there has to be something else. We we insist. And it makes me say, whoa, you know, you're, you're going to tell the school this, but they're saying, you know, they're, they have a different, they have a different relationship to to, to hierarchies mm-hmm. than even my generation. Mm-hmm. And um, it's kind of hard, right? When, 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 when the student says to you, this is, you know, Columbia University is named after Christopher Columbus. And what does that mean, <laughs> right? It's hard, it, whereas I, I think I, as a student, I would have been afraid to tell President Bollinger or something like that. I just wouldn't have been able to do that. And they're able to do that. And so even if the, the university doesn't want to change, how are you going to answer these questions? These very, and it's very public questions, right? We have a different social world where these questions are, are happening, not in, not behind closed doors. And so, so, so change is an iterative, iterative process. It comes in fits and starts. Um, but there is this, when there's a driving force, it may not happen right away, but those, um, so I would like to think the work that my generation did where to create a crum- some crumbles, right? To, to, to dislocate the foundation. Mm-hmm. And then the next generation comes and shakes that, 
foundation that's already begun to crumble or shakes the facade mm -hmm. and in, in pieces it comes down or it changes. Thank you. Enough. I just wanted to just quickly connect with what Mignon was saying. Um, just really quickly, just to, to, to connect with, I think that's also happening in the larger society as well, with regard to changing the names of buildings, changing, uh, pulling down uh, statues of white men who have perpetrated crimes on humanity, even though they have also been viewed as doing very positive things. And I do think that that is part of the larger um, structure um, in terms of our society, making these sort of small incremental changes and refusing to go along with the status quo that we've been going along with for so long. So I appreciate your, your comment. It reminds me of that. And and, and thank you both for your comments. And I'm gonna I'm gonna say this from a place of you know frustration, but also hope, right? Which is enough, mm -hmm. right? So you know I say that you know as a, an act up guy, who like screamed and yelled and threw himself on the street, right? Because we didn't want to die, but at the never really gave up hope that we were gonna get through this. But I will tell you that. I do also, like Mignon, have hope that the, what we did is going to give power to a new generation, right, to actually question things. Like, you know, Mignon and I probably read the same damn books in, like, the core of literature humanities. I was like, Greeks again? And, like, I'm a Greek, but, like, come on, man. Like, enough <laughs> of the Greeks, right? right? So, so let them push it and change lit humanities and music humanities and CC and all of that stuff so it's inclusive of the world. But I will say to you that we even, Anna, we have work to do here at our institution. You know, when I first came here and we decided we were gonna have a concentration in LGBTQ health, right? The first, world's first concentration. You know, an individual said to me, a colleague said to me, oh, people are saying there's too much LGBTQ at the school. And I said, what, what the F does that mean, right? And you know, and that kind of aggression goes on all the time. And so we need, yes, academ academia is really hard to change, but you know what? I'm done. And I think those of, those of us who are, who are part of this conversation today, those of us who are in a leadership role, those of us who look like me have a responsibility to say enough. You know what? The guidelines for promotion and tenure are racist. And I'm going to say that till the day I die. And what are they going to do? Fire me? Good luck trying to fire me. And so we have to act up, we have to speak up, we have to question, we have to push, we have to do it respectfully, hopefully, but we can't just stay silent about it anymore because I look at my school, which is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful representation of students in terms of um, um, race and culture and first gen. And then I look at my faculty and it's a joke. And it's a joke because I can't hire people that look like America because of the restrictions that are placed upon me about how I, am, I, how I uh, recruit and how I retain people. So we have to fight around these issues and it has to happen now. And I think what we saw last, I'm gonna say it, what we saw last night, you know, on the television, on the MSNBC or the CNN or whatever you watched was, uh, you know, the, uh, a representation of like the last days of the Roman empire trying to hold on to that last inch of power before everything changes. So my hope in this is that this is the last thing before things change. I so appreciate the ways that all three of you in very different ways got at structure. And structure as kind of the obstacle and the, the place that we have to focus efforts on change. And like us to come a level down in our final word, which is as we wait for institutions to change, at, whether it's incremental, iterative, understanding the, the difficulties, the complexities. How do we work to support young men and women who like Tyler are navigating the right now? What are your words around what needs to happen to ensure that there is a sense of um, safety, right? That there is room for people to show up and be authentic while we wait for institutions and structures to change. So I, I'm, I'm going to jump in here because I want to, sorry to, if I'm being hyper-masculine here, guys. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk about Danielle Green. Danielle Green was one of my students. She's an African-American uh, woman, a lesbian who worked, was in the military, 
who was at an MPH student in our school and now is a, a leader at one of the local universities, uh, one of the local hospitals here, who after I came to the school said to me, oh my God, I didn't know I could be a dean. And then I saw you, an openly gay man, right? Not the same race, not the same gender identity, but an openly gay man living your truth as a gay person every single day. Mm -hmm. So what I'm gonna ask for my LGBTQ um, peers is to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I don't get to be gay just sometimes. I'm gay 24 seven. And mm -hmm. so the more I am my authentic self, and the more I realize that as a gay man, I am not also the sole representation of the LGBTQ population and own that and say that, the more students like Tyler and students who look different or are, are different from Tyler will feel safe in their spaces. Thank you. Final word, Mignon Allen, please. I don't wanna go last, so I'll go next. Take it away, Mignon. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen, Ellen is going to bring us home with the depth. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I don't have any profound words. Um, I can just say what I've tried to do okay. and what I try to help my, um, my uh, university and my college do through my leadership and governance work. And that's um, talk the talk and walk the walk. Mm -hmm. And, and so when I teach, I try to, um, I talk about these issues and the freedom that comes with being able to be a full self and allow others, allow others to be their full selves and what that would mean in, you know, within the, the whatever the, the course, it's a course on gender or intersectionality or uh, sociology of African American life, what it would mean in those moments, and and I try to project that in the classroom in terms of others speaking and and sharing, and I can see it. I mean, um, I can see them grow. I could see them stand taller through the mm -hmm. semester uh, as they realize that they can have a voice, mm -hmm. and um, and I try I try in in my my leadership and governance work to do that, to put things on the table, right? To, to say what is, what everyone is dancing around. If I'm on the, I'm on the university Senate and I try, I try to make sure that um, we're, we're living up to our ideals. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so I think if, if people, individuals in the, in the institution would, would, uh, work on those things in the different aspects of institutional life, um, I'm hopeful that it would, it would uh, also resonate in those interpersonal sessions. And students tell me that they've, long after class, they've talked about, they continue to talk about the ideas in class in other settings, in the dorms or when they're eating. And that kind of change, I think, can help when you have these moments where students are trying to figure out what to do, you know, how, how, how to behave, how to, how to treat others, how to treat others. And so I'm, I'm, I'm 50, I'm not, you know, in, in the dorm anymore, <laughs> but, um, you know, so that would be the way I would, I would try to make an impact, you know, um, in, in the work that I do. You said she had nothing profound to offer. I would disagree. Uh, Alan, please, final word. Yeah, I disagree too. I think both what Perry and Mignon offered was very profound. I don't know if what I have to offer will be, but I, I can say that um, in my work um, and in really the way that I've tried to live my life uh, to honor authenticity, uh, to also um, understand that safety is relative, right? Mm -hmm. And contextual. And I think I have, I have shown my students this time and time again, that being authentic is sometimes um, costly and can sometimes be exhausting actually when you are not joined 
by the group or when you are not joined and supported by the organization and so, or the institution. And so one of the things that I really value is I do think it's important, uh, you know, Anna, in, in relation to your question is how do we help um, our students and our academic community uh, to feel safer? Well, I think it's important to understand that um, it's okay to say when you don't feel safe, mm. right? It's okay, it should be permissible to say, um, you know, like for example, when I have, you know, as Minyam was talking about in, 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 in the committee work that I've done as a faculty member, when I have said the unspeakable thing, which I'm actually kind of well known for doing in my family and in multiple, <laughs> multiple communities, Carrie knows that, but I mean, um, when I have said that unspeakable thing and I get punished for it yeah. in a particular way, I have learned that I can say I am being punished mm -hmm. and I am not being joined. Mm -hmm. And why is that happening? What is going on? And I think that, we, you know, I think it's a fantasy to think that we are always going to walk in spaces that are safe for us because, you know, if anyone listens to, and I hope they do, what we've talked about today, we know that's not true. But what we can do is we can deconstruct the lack of safety and ask why, it, why, why it's that way and ask why we're not being joined. And, you know, I think that is really what group work has taught me, um, you know, in my life and as well as what I have internalized that doesn't belong to me, that belongs to someone else, right? That has been projected upon me and, and, and asking people to take their projections back. Mm. Asking people to take the things that they are um, putting on you back and take ownership of that. And there's a lot of different ways to do that institutionally, uh, but it's really, really hard work. And I think that um, sometimes the system just likes to rely on one or two of us who's willing to do it. And everybody else kind of just puts their head down and, and, and goes about their business and does with, you know, important things that they need to do. But I just think that it's important to really, really, really understand um, the limits of our capacity and the importance of speaking out when we, when we need assistance and when we need to be joined. And I'll just say one more thing. Um, Perry, when you talked about your colleague who set, made that um, really ignorant comment to you about you know, there's too much LGBTQ going on here. That's an example right there of the system resisting change, right? The system pushing back and using you as the focus point of resisting that change because of your leadership role. And um, those are the kinds of things that um, are fear-based and those are the kinds of things that I think we need to continue to interrogate and speak out about because that was also a t an attack on you. Mm -hmm. and what you are trying to do, which means it was an attack on the system. Again, you said, I don't think I have anything profound to add. I can, I disagree. Uh, this panel, man, my greatest thanks. Uh, I had high hopes uh, for what we would be able to discuss and get to, and you exceeded them on all fronts. Simply amazing, uh, brilliant, thoughtful conversation. I so appreciate the time that you spent with us today. And to all of those watching the live stream, thank you for joining us for this moment to learn, understand, and remember. Our aim was to reflect on Tyler's life, but to use it as a moment to imagine the path forward. And the brilliant panelists, Perry, Mignon, and Ellen today helped us to think beyond the lenses of LGBTQ identity alone to imagine its implications for a wide range of identities, including race, but class, and gender identity more broadly. So thank you again to the panelists. Thank you to all of us for joining, to all of you for joining. And we're gonna close now with a video from Wuckers at talking about the ways that the university itself has changed in the last 10 years to take steps as we've talked about to become a more inclusive and welcoming climate, to take steps to hope, right? We can't guarantee, but to take steps to ensure that students like Tyler who come to Rutgers don't experience, don't have the same experience as he did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Tyler Clementi's untimely death brought a moment of reckoning, which compelled Rutgers to develop programs and services that support belonging and inclusion, so the university can make good on the promise of its core values. Hi, my name is Kiwan Kalk, and I use he and him pronouns. I'm the director for the Center for Social Justice Education and LGBT Communities. I think the research that Rutgers has done to acknowledge and unpack our painful histories has caused us to grow and be better. My name is Will Vargas, and I'm the lead community-based counselor at CAPS. CAPS stands for Counseling, ADAPS, and Psychiatric Services. One of the things you might not know about CAPS is that we have community-based counselors embedded at various locations, a residence hall, and the cultural centers. Over these past 10 years, we've made real progress, real changes to become a safer, more respectful community. When I think about community, I think about the people who support and uplift one another. It is with those same people that we find education, empowerment, as well as are able to be brave, courageous, and our authentic selves. Community is inclusive, it invites, is welcoming, and it feels safe. Rutgers is its best when you can be you, and you can be you, and you can be you. We're better as a community and our work will never be done. Ever mindful of Tyler's memory, we recognize above all that we must keep growing and learning together. Thank you for joining us for today's Tyler Clemente Symposium. Special thanks to our guests, President Jonathan Holloway, Jane Clemente, Dr. Perry Helkitis, Dr. Minion Moore, and Dr. Ellen Short. To connect with the Tyler Clemente Center for Diversity Education and Bias Prevention, or the Division of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement at Rutgers New Brunswick, visit the diversity.rutgers.edu website to explore the anti-racism reading list, LinkedIn learning paths, and other resources for faculty diversity and inclusion and educational equity. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Tyler Clementis Center and at RU Diversity.